Just a second. I'll be right with you guys. Hello. It is a very shaken Illuminostic, totally gutted at the moment. <clears throat> the uh, condenser mic that I've had since I started this channel that I used for this gig, I apparently left in one of the vans on the way um, on the way home, which, you know, I was just saying how so many things went right yesterday. Something's got to go wrong. And then I started looking around for my condenser mic, and I realized it's definitely not here. So great time to join the Patreon uh, and, um, you know, plenty of options to support the channel in the chat. Check out the video I just posted. It's not gonna, it's, 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 it's already available for my patrons. Um, and it's going to be available for the rest of you bums um, Saturday. And on Saturday, I'm going to an unpronounceable ruin uh, with a absolutely delightful woman, a local author, who um, wrote a book called The Sorcerer's Stone. Stones, the sorcerer's stones, I believe, because it's a reference to, you know, these concentric circles and all these other sort of interesting um, patterns that have been created in the ground. Um, but on this hike up the, the mountain, if you didn't see the live stream, I found uh, p p human teeth and part of a, a skull and green, I think, peridot, like mic micro, micro peridot crystals um, on quartz and uh, a, a cup, a broken cup inking cup so it was, it was really interesting and then up higher there are um more like cliff dwellings and stuff but I, I didn't want to go up there because um i was alone and this trail started getting pretty like if you're not an inca you you probably shouldn't try this kind of vibes so um let me uh get set up for what we're actually going to do tonight which i think means i need to put my screen capture um, here and shrink this down to there and move it. Whoops, man, I'm just terrible at this stuff. Um, because speaking of talks, you know, where I left the, uh, the microphone coming home, <laughs> um, Okay, there we go. So this one, I'm sorry, guys. I should have done all this before I uh, went live. It's going to be difficult for the people in the shorts, actually, to see anything meaningful. In fact, it's just ignoring the screen capture thing. So maybe there's nothing I can do for you guys. It's just going to be a talk for the people in the... <laughs> shorts uh with no video i guess just some pretty lights but uh i gave i gave, i was one of the speakers i guess you would call it a panel um panel discussion um in psoc the other day and the speakers were quite remarkably good um and in fact Two of them had a very similar background to me uh, in Hermeticism and the Western mystery tradition, and um, they were quite brilliant, uh, but there are some serious, serious points of divergence, and these aren't small matters that I think you know, are, are insignificant, and I'm, I'm, I'm certainly doing this from a place of love and respect, and it's not all... A, a debate with people that can't answer. There's plenty that I'm just going to reinforce and agree with. So definitely not about that. Um, but I just felt like there was a lot I could add. And also, since this is on my channel, there are some things that I don't agree with. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to point that out and explain why. Um, because this is a very important uh, topic that is affecting a lot of people. Um, oh, it's a video. That's why I can't find it. So... Um, Let's see, is there anything else right. that I need to preface? Uh, but I wanted to sure. say that I'm very glad. Oh, I have to take my hat off. Hang my hat on where my real microphone should be. Oh, sorry about the unfocused start, guys, but I literally just discovered this missing microphone as I was setting up. So all of my plans went out um, the back of my head. 
um, in regards to how I was going to set this up. And so for those of you that haven't seen this yet, this is a talk that is basically supposed to be about the shadow side of psychedelics, although that didn't come up much, and I'm going to fix that <laughs> uh, in, this, in this stream. And, um, you know, the important thing, I think, that we were really like the crux of the apostrophe, the bullet point of this presentation, is that there is an awareness that there's a lack of proper preparation. And part of that is due to the profit motive. People don't want to tell their clients to wait a year. You know, if you're going to become a shaman, and it used to be in most tribes, that the shaman drank the ayahuasca, and the patient was healed. And, um, you know, that might sound ridiculous to a person that doesn't understand, but if you have had ayahuasca with a, a competent shaman, then you know about the telepathy, you know about the, the body intelligence sort of feedback loop that can be created. Uh, and there's no denying it. It's not like it's some abstract thing where the shaman is like ballparking, you know, like vague kind of like Edgar Casey style predictions or something. It's not like that at all. Not like that at all. And we will get into that eventually. Um, but so, you know, the idea here is that the Western mysteries are actually a shamanic tradition. And there are Europeans that have it in their bloodline, in their lineage, to work with plant medicines in a shamanic context. In fact, uh, there are a lot of parallels between what we know of the Kaikion and the inner circle, uh, the Apoptie uh, at the uh, Eleusinian Mysteries, <clears throat> and the approach of many of the um, ayahuasqueros in the Amazon, especially the Shuar, in terms of the secrecy and the um, idea that only the elect are allowed to imbibe um, this stuff. So. Uh, let's just go ahead and jump into this, and I will just pause it when I feel like I am compelled to interject. Ads that everybody's here. This is Ariel. And um, we will be speaking in turns, and also would welcome your input and your participation. Um, so there's going to be five of us speaking, and we're going to take in between, you know, if there's like any pressing question, like, you know, that you don't want to hold in, we'll ask you to uh, put it forward at that time, but it would be good to leave the discussion for the whole group at the end, so we'll give everybody a chance to speak, because I think some of the things that might be in your mind are going to be addressed, so um, that's kind of the structure, and we're going to kind of wing it. Um, so. Um, I wanted to say first that uh, the plan was to have um, this as the first in a series and we were not able to get um, either um, a local Wachimero to participate or uh, somebody from a Huni Queen family so in the future uh, we will have the next one focusing on... It literally just dawned on me that I was the substitute for the hypothetical indigenous person. <laughs> That's kind of an honor, I guess, the universe. Um, you know, it's <laughs> Man, I'm slow sometimes. The kind of complex relationship around... Hey, look, it's my missing mic. See that beautiful mic right there? Yep, yeah, it's gone. Western practitioners and indigenous. Uh, for this one, uh, I'm going to speak first because, uh, in a way, it was my idea. I came up with the organization. I asked everybody to come together, and it's focused on a more specific theme, uh, which is something that's kind of close to my heart and I've also written about, which is um, how this um, desire, which I think is very innate in our soul for awakening, can often be hijacked and captured and uh, put through certain detours that are uh, putting us through time lags or preventing or putting obstacles in front of us. Um, so my understanding, um, uh, based on my own experience, is that um, as human beings, uh, we are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So if you think of the creation myths that have been in different cultures, just want to check in with the chat real quick and make sure um, everything's good because sometimes I get into these and then people are like, hey, there's no audio. Um, 
and I don't see any complaints, so let's keep continuing. What, what happened to the mic, Ga- Ga- Gabby? I, I I left it in 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 one of the vans, I think. Um, which is not something I can afford to do. It definitely is not. Um, definitely isn't. So join the Patreon. Consider uh, supporting the channel. <laughs> Because I'm a dumbass, and I need help <laughs> to get another mic. Um, no, but seriously, I, I, I can replace it. I just, it's not going to be fun. Um, <laughs> so, also the thing that I, I hold this mic with was in the box with it, so I don't have a stand for this either. That's why I'm holding it. Um, there's this idea that there's this unnameable divine source, and as it steps down into manifestation, it begins to fragment into fractals. Those fractals are divine qualities. They may be the quality of um, justice or truth or um, of love or uh, of courage. And as those fractals go even deeper into um, manifestation, if you think of the tree of life, it goes through certain stages. As it keeps going down, it hits certain obstacles. So those divine qualities begin to fragment even more and to become distortions of themselves. So for example, if you have the quality of love that wants to express as loving others, as being loved, when it hits those distortions, it could become something like seeking approval. So to all of these distortions, we get to where we are in the present, which is Malkut in, in the Kabbalistic system, which is this material incarnation, this body, all of the traumas we've had in childhood, all of the baggage that we've brought in karmically. And when we are approaching something, it's usually from that perspective, from one of those sub subpersonalities from one of those fragments. And the journey is called in, in the Kabbalistic system and in other Western esotericisms, the path of return. So what we are doing is we are going back up. And as we are going back up that scale, um, there are some things that are obstacles because it's just in the nature of that fragmentation that we have those distortions and those wounds. Um, And those distortions and wounds are also preyed upon by certain forces that want to keep us off track, want to keep us off this path of awakening. So um, that was initially the, the proposal or the idea for this. So what I wanted to speak about through my own experience is uh, some of those, uh, both those truths and those beauties of I, as I've experienced them, but also some of those distortions. And I wanted to say first that um, I'm very grateful for the training that I had with ayahuasca, which has opened up incredible vistas to me. And also to confess that at some point I felt like I had gotten the message enough and it was time to hang up the phone. Um, what I've experienced um, in my own path is that if you think of the term entheogens, you know, it's about this um, opening to the divine, which can happen. So these plant medicines can be portals in which we connect not to thought forms of what we think the divine is, but to the actual thread that's coming down that line of manifestation. But it is actually, in, in truth, an opening, a portal to the astral world. And in that astral world, we can meet many different things, some of which are our own thought forms, some of which are thought forms connected to strings that are still in the astral, that are some in the lower astral, some in the higher, but they're not in the higher realms. So if I can give an example, um, when I started training, one of the first experiences that I had when I asked for beings of light uh, was these very blonde, Pleiadian-looking figures that uh, told me how special I was and that they were going to be my guide and that they were going to show me certain things and I felt like something is off. And um, I asked if they were there for my highest interest and uh, they disappeared. And I think it's important to have this kind of discernment. um, um, And you can tell because if you're getting these visions in like wild technicolor, you're in the astral. So in, uh, in the Kabbalistic system, you can distinguish between the real thread that's coming from above because those encounters are not visual. They're not 
Okay, so here's where I start having some issues. Um, <clears throat> she says those encounters with intuition are not visual, and that if they are, they're not real intuition. That's absolutely not true. That might be true for women, and for speaking from her point of view, that may be true, but I absolutely have gotten intuitions through visions. In fact, the um, one of the primary m mechanisms or um, modalities of operation that we all use as magician and shaman is a vision in order to inform ourselves of intuitive things. So that may be that that's more masculine. <clears throat> um, also, um, this reference to the astral and the um, planes of the Kabbalah, I, the way I understand it, there's no connection to that. Um, the three veils of negative existence, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but three veils of negative existence are not the astral. However, what she's saying about how there are layers to um, the level of access uh, when you take uh, DMT in particular, a lot of people talk about the waiting room, and then there's like a midpoint where you might encounter some entities and then there's the breakthrough level. Um, and another thing I'm not sure if I'm clear on, but I think she was saying that you don't ever get to the highest levels um, when you use psychedelics, and I don't think that's true at all. In fact, I don't see any evidence that anyone, and, and Terrence McKenna would talk about this, the, the, the literature um, does not, excuse me, uh, establish that people that don't use entheogens have gone farther than people that do, in fact, quite the opposite. So, um, yeah, you know, I think it's just a, a slight matter of um, making a, a different interpretation, but um, significant nevertheless. I mean, I, my experience was that when I first started drinking ayahuasca, I had um, really messy experiences in terms of the visions. You know, the first time it was just like a vague kind of annoying, like, blur of like not even geometry is just like a splat and it was kind of brown and red and, and it went away after a few minutes and I felt sick and that's all that happened. And then the next time I took it, I think there was a little bit more and I might have vomited. And then the, the next time I took it, there was like this screen that formed in front of me with these like yellow tentacles. And then when they were in the screen, I didn't mind them so much, but they started coming out of it and they were like way too 3D and real. Uh, and I actually, actually, it was the only time I think, no, 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 there's one other time where I almost like tapped out and asked for some charcoal or something. I mean, that won't really do anything, but, um, you know, it was too much. I also didn't know what vasoconstriction was. I was freezing. Um, but the point is that as these, um, visions, uh, or, or the, the number of ceremonies that I had set through, uh, increased, the visions became more and more coherent. And what she's talking about, about these like really bright colored astral kind of visions, um, I don't associate that with the astral plane at all in the, you know, scientific illuminisms and magical practices. The astral plane is not this insane, you know, like multicolored, it's, it's at that, I don't, I don't recognize that um, connection um, with the idea of the astral. Uh, but I do know what she's talking about, how at the lower um, level of like a DMT experience, it's very bright colored, things are moving very quickly, nothing makes any sense. And then eventually, after 11 ceremonies, I broke through to an entirely different level. Things were crystal clear, totally coherent. Um, the visions were, you know, <clears throat> like uh, like movie quality, only more real. And there were these sort of like Egyptian-looking god guys that had um, these staffs. And there was a ball of light that represented creation material, I guess. Um, some of you may know what I'm talking about if I reference the, you know, when you're, even when you take LSD, you'll see these like ribbons of like translucent color that almost look like they maybe have some kind of code in them or something floating around. They were sticking their staffs in there and pulling out like, like sheets of that stuff. And it was like making universes and, um, there was nothing cartoony or, you know, strange about that at all. And then furthermore, in terms of, you know, people that say that you can't access the highest levels, they have never had bufotenine. I mean, um, the, well, it is until you burn it, then it's 5-MeO-DMT. Um, <clears throat> because 
What happens with psychedelics, I think, is that they turn down a reducing valve in our nervous system that allows us to perceive the ultimate reality. And the degree in which parts of that uh, filter are turned down um, determine you know, what aspects and to what extent uh, the filter's turned off. And 5-MeO-DMT, a large dose of it, turns it all the way off. Uh, I've done it with NN-DMT, too. It was an insane amount, but it worked. Um, and it's exactly as, you know, the Buddha and everyone else described. It is the source of our consciousness, which is pure light. A photon is eternal at the speed of light. Uh, there is no time, so it's unchanging. <laughs> it's not really there, so it's nothing. Um, and yet it is everything because all matters light in a standing wave. And so, you know, that's the code cracked. And, um, <clears throat> you know, no one is going to convince me that just because you didn't take 30 years sitting there waiting to accomplish this and maybe not even get it done, that it's not real because you short circuited the system with a chemical. Um, it's just a matter of evolution, you know, it really is. It used to take, you know, remember how slow dial up was? That's Buddhist meditation compared to psychedelics. You know, my high speed internet right now, 50 MPS, um, compared to 1997 dial up. Sorry, Dalai Lama. Visual intuition doesn't function that way. So if you have like this overwhelming sense <coughs> of energy and um, almost like seeing a light behind something. Uh, this is much more of approximation to an encounter with the real entity that is there for your highest good, and you can always pose the question. Um, and after I had several of these encounters, which I felt were with false light or with different kind of entities, and I was telling this at our last meeting, when I asked for the highest being of light that I could access, I got Christ. And at the first I was like, no, not this guy, this is not my tradition, I have nothing to do with this. And I understood at the beginning that it was an archetype that I was working with, an archetype of unconditional love, of surrender, but not just an archetype in the astral, that there was this thread that was coming from above, that I was having an encounter with, with this real presence. And uh, I wanted to mention this because you can have very different experiences depending on your readiness, your preparation, what you're bringing to the experience. And uh, this brings me to a second point that I wanted to make, that in a lot of the ancient traditions, um, entheogens were seen as sacraments, as initiations, that came after certain periods of preparation, which were very long and very intense. So after you, know, you knew how to stabilize your energy, how to work with certain things, there were ways of bringing you to a higher truth. And in a sense, for the people that didn't have that preparation, they had no business going there. So it's quite a different uh, context in which we're living today. You know? And this is not just in the Western esoteric uh, system, but also in the Eastern. Uh, in which there's lots of stories about Soma and you know how a lot of Buddhist monks were uh, consuming mushrooms and different things. But it was after a certain level of preparation, after knowing how to do the shadow work in a way, how to work with your own energy, how to stabilize, that those uh, experiences were brought to, to bring to a higher level. And I think this is really missing today. And it's because of this that there is this lack of discernment. And you have uh, people like this video that, um, that I shared with this woman who came to PSAC to uh, drink ayahuasca with the shaman so she can communicate with the aliens about the pyramids. Uh, you know, you don't know what you're going to get in the astral. If you don't have the discernment to be able to feel if, if that um, entity that is communicating with you is a higher truth and is coming from a higher order, you're going to get pulled in all kinds of different directions. So that just made something occur to me that uh, I don't know that any of us really brought up. Um, <clears throat> The, the everyone, you know, we all kind of talk about how we're lacking in an initiatory process and proper preparation for, um, you know, and it's not just casual ayahuasca drinking. And I don't mean that in the recreational sense. I just mean people that are curious or, you know, most of the people that do this end up getting pretty serious about it. Um, and a lot of them get it into their heads that they're going to be shaman or, you know, they at least become very mystical. And the thing is, you know, in the mystery tradition, there is not a hierarchy because there is, 
you know, someone that's on a pedestal, the way that we think about, um, you know, a president, people get that weird alpha monkey kind of worship thing and, you know, the Jesus thing and all that, you know, where the, you put the shaman on a pedestal and it's not like that. The reason that it's there is that there is a, a curriculum <laughs> And there is a structured uh, approach that requires you to learn about psychology, to learn about physics, to learn about geometry, to learn about, you know, all kinds of different um, disciplines and um, just subjects that support your development as an individual. And so the reality is if you take some psychedelic and you build your brain so that you have, you know, more brain cells firing, you have more uh, neuronal networks, you have greater plasticity so you can learn faster, but you're just, you know, reading new age gobbledygook on the internet or whatever, you're just literally going to become an idiot with wind whistling through your ears because your brain has left the building. You know what I mean? This, that's not... <coughs> the. <laughs> The medicines can do a lot, and they can offer you insights. They can teach you things. I'm absolutely not discounting that. But um, without the context of proper support, um, it's almost, I would say, more often than not, it's more of a train wreck than it is um, a benefit. Um, <clears throat> although I will have to say that I generally find people that have been a little bit, um, They've gone off the rails a little bit on the Wuchu train, more tolerable than people that have not had any psychedelics at all. And this is, you know, um, um, kind of an in-between situation. The worst situations is that people can actually get uh, hijacked and possessed. Um, and I've seen several of these stories. I didn't want to go into detail, but... That right there, though? I mean, you guys heard that? I'm almost angry. Um, I had to, like, take a quick breath. Um, that's not true. I, I do not believe in uh, possession. I do not believe in demons. I do not believe in spiritual attachments. I do not believe in parasitical entities. N some of these other people that are going to speak say that as well. And I think this belief is extremely dangerous, extremely toxic. It leads to a ton of spiritual bypassing. Um, <clears throat> and it's just not real, you know. Uh, and I do believe she says something like, you know, there's danger in believing in these things. So I'm not, you know, this isn't about arguing with her. This is just about making this point, <laughs> you know. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and, and it's also supported by a tremendous amount of research, you know, that if you do not believe in demons, they cannot affect you. Every study ever done has established this. If you look at cultures where there is no belief in demons, they don't have any phenomena that even resembles it. So why would you let the vampire in your house if all it requires is for you to choose not to believe in them? And the reality is, I think, if there were invisible entities tormenting and attacking humanity throughout all of history, you know, I mean, yeah, sure, the planet is a mess, but you can understand that in terms of the basic laws of duality, that there have to be antinomies and perfect balance. You know, it's 50-50, dark and light, and all of the metaphorical things that come with that. So, um, you know, when you believe that you have a spirit, here's another thing that a, a shaman will do, right? A bad shaman. Even a shaman that doesn't know he's bad can be subconsciously, uh, you know, motivated by profit motive and stuff. And um, <clears throat> one of their most, and, and not just shaman, but psychics do this a lot. I have a friend that got suckered hard. Like he still thinks that it's all real. Um, and so... The psychic will have a sh brief conversation with you or a shaman, whatever, and get to know a little bit about you. And it's a pretty good bet at this juncture that you think you are wanting to be the reincarnation of some shaman or magician or some kind of seer or something, you know. So they tell you that. And now they have you invested in an idea that you want to believe, right? And by the way, from a, an illuminism point of view, an illuminist point of view, it is unethical to tell someone else what their past reincarnations are. They have to discover it for themselves because especially if they have stock in you, if they believe in you, and you put this in their idea, they could never find out the truth if you're wrong. And if, you have, if you're so arrogant that you don't doubt yourself, you know what I mean? Anyone that understands psychology and the human experience should know better than to do that. So the fact that there are people that will charge you for this service is pretty alarming to me anyways. <clears throat> so 
hook you into believing what they say by telling you something you want to hear. And then they tell you, oh, and by the way, in the case of my friend, you have this woman who is an evil lost spirit that has been attached to you, and that's why you had trouble connecting to your children, and you blah, 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 blah. And I can wiggle, wiggle my fingers around and remove it for 1500 bucks or whatever. So, um, no, she can't. The reality is that the person might believe that you have taken this entity away and you're still going to be the emotionally detached asshole that you were before the entity was removed, but you're going to believe that you're better, so you're going to be twice as bad. This stuff is not good, and I hope you guys can see why it's really easy to sell people because everybody wants an easy fix and they want somebody else to do it for them. So people are really ready to believe in this kind of stuff when the reality is that person probably needs a bobin sauna for months and some ayahuasca and some psychotherapy and you know what I mean? All sorts of things in order to figure out what the source of the trauma is that caused the emotional detachment in the first place. And you know what I mean? So you got to get real. If it sounds too good to be true, if it sounds like it came from a Harry Potter book or something, it did, you know, so... Um, continuing on. <laughs> but uh, one of the people who I've worked with for many years actually committed suicide um, a few uh, weeks ago. And uh, it was obvious to those of us that knew her that something was going on. She went to Colombia, she, was, she did uh, ayahuasca with a lot of people who felt took advantage and abused her. And, um, you know, there's different levels. So the worst case scenario can be quite bad. And I think this is why it's important um, to bring back this idea that this is something special. This is a sacrament, a form of initiation. And there is, you know, uh, levels and stages of preparation that can be beneficial um, to go through. And I'm just going to make the third point and then pass it on. Um, I think another feature that is part of not just uh, the matrix surrounding psychedelics, but spirituality as a whole, is this tendency, which is a result of commodification, to um, have this quest for, for more, to consume more. I'm going to do one more, and the next one will be the bigger one, and then finally I'm going to do the really big one, and the really big one is going to like leap me into enlightenment. So there's this tendency to keep consuming on the outside, and it's this seeking tendency. And um, what I received as, as, my own, um, as my own insight after a long time of training and after many encounters is that those feeling states and those insights and those epiphanies that came as the result of this encounter with Madre Ayahuasca was not the encounter with Madre Ayahuasca, it was actually the portal to my higher self. And the last insight and message that I received is after this death journey, which was extremely profound um, and lasted like three days of birth, was that everything that I experienced, I could do on my own. And so, um, one thing that she said about how um, she doesn't necessarily feel like what ayahuasca connected with her to was, was Pachamama or Madre Ayahuasca. Um, <clears throat> that's been my opinion forever. I do not see why it is that a vine would be able to tell you how to, um, you know, get over your traumatic childhood. <laughs> Uh, it sits in the ground with its roots in the dirt, and it grows. Um, I think the likelihood is that it, it changes our, our brain chemistry, and it changes the way that we uh, interface with the universal mind, and so we have a different experience, and we have different access to information, um, but I, I, I really don't believe that it's um, actually a plant spirit that we are communicating with at all. And um, not all... Uh, Traditional shamans think that either. Um, in fact, the best that I've ever known, his answer was, what, what is this? And, and it, yeah, I don't know. We don't know. No one knows. You know, so he says, sometimes we think about it one way or another because it suits whatever's happening, but we don't know what it is. No one knows what it is. Terrence McKenna said that he heard that as well, I think, in one of his books. That the important thing is to have that connection as a daily connection to this uh, higher self, to this, and the higher self I think of as the soul and the spirit is something a bit different. But to have this connection in which every day you're receiving this guidance and you know that it's true, 
And if you have that, the practices and the path and everything else will follow. So that last message was extremely profound for me, and it influenced the way in which I work with myself and others, because I see it as a kind of stepping down. You know, the, the feeling states and the insights that I got from that work, I transferred into meditations and breath work, which in many cases were very similar to the ayahuasca experience, and I thought, you know, this is really groovy, I can really do this on my own. But actually, no, I couldn't. And uh, whatever states I achieved in those meditations and uh, out-of-body experiences are also uh, not the real thing. The real thing is to be able to transfer that to how you live every day with your eyes open, to how you interact with others. You can call it mindfulness or something else, but to be able to be in that presence in which you know how to lucid dream through life. So having that was about as profound. I'm almost tempted to rewind that <laughs> and play it again. But what she just said is one of the most important lessons that you could possibly ever understand from any of this stuff. It's the real. I mean, look at the way look at the way Andrew's looking at her right now. <laughs> That's absolutely great. I've seen how to lucid dream through ayahuasca experiences and through my own meditations. It's like the real step down is to be able to live that every day in every moment, in ordinary encounters and things that are not out of the ordinary. So I think um, this, for me, is, is the real uh, focus and the beauty of this work, that it needs to be stepped down uh, and uh, to be able to receive those insights. And once you've gotten them, you know, like Alan Watts said, you have gotten the message enough times, you can hang up the phone because it can become a trap. And uh, this I also understood in the last um, in the last experience that I had, and um, and I thought of Castaneda and also Mircea Eliade, who said something similar. That um, and I think Castaneda, when he's speaking um, through Don Juan or the other way around, um, and maybe it's doubtful which. Uh, says something like, there used to be these old seers, and they had these powers of seeing, they could see. They could see what was off, and you know, they could see the future, they could see many things. They had this direct connection to, um, to this thread that was coming from above, from source consciousness. And they lost that connection because of a certain kind of fall. Uh, they got corrupted by power. And once they lost that connection, they went and they hid in the mountains and in the forest, and there they discovered the plants. And the plants allowed them to get that connection again. So the plants functioned as a way of self-remembering, but it was also a trap because the self-remembering is meant to be temporary. And, um, and in a way, they kept using the plants in order to get that power. And Eliade says something similar about the, the shamans that need psychedelics to go into trance. It's because they can't achieve the trance on their own. So I think the important thing to remember is that, you know, although these, these plant medicines are beautiful and they can give us that experience of self-remembering, what they are teaching us is that everything is within. So there's some point on that climb up the ladder in which, you know, you can say it's enough and now, you know, I've, I've received those messages and I can do it on my own. So, Okay, <clears throat> I love this woman. She ha has been kind to me before I ever met her. She welcomed me. This community reached out to me, spent, you know, probably an hour um, just randomly communicating with me because she knew I'd been recently through the split up with my partner and stuff. She's absolutely amazing, intelligent, brilliant. And I, I am behind her 98% of the way. <laughs> but the thing about demonic possession, um, I, I had to say something about that because it, I think it's important that we just stop with that crap. Um, <clears throat> and then furthermore, this idea, like Terrence McKenna said, that people can get higher with drugs and without them is complete bullshit. And uh, Andrew is going to say that as well eventually. Um, but here's the proof, you guys. You have to understand there is no woo in the universe. There is no woo. None of it's real. There is no woo. Zero woo. Zero. Right? That doesn't mean there isn't telepathy. It doesn't mean there isn't precognition. It doesn't mean there isn't even a God. You know, the way things work out in my life, you know, increasingly I'm actually having more and more of a difficult time doubting that there is a something like a God. I don't, I don't think he's a big furry man that is sitting in the clouds and judging and 
and directing our affairs exactly. It's way more sophisticated than that, I'm afraid. But um, this idea that people can go further or can do it without psychedelics, no one's ever seen it. Show me. Show me somebody. Show me somebody that can heal. Show me a Buddhist that can heal cancer. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, did, give me a break, man. Um, the uh, most accurate prophetical statements, telepathy, all of the actual demonstrations of this stuff that I've ever seen have come from people that are shamans or even just people that have taken entheogens. You cannot compete with the normal human brain with one that has, you know, a thousand times the, the neurogenesis happening um, and neuroplasticity. Uh, the filters are just down, you know. Um, <clears throat> it's like you can't run a, a, a program meant for a Commodore 64 on a Dell G, G at G5, whatever this thing is, you know what I mean? Like, it's just not going to happen. So you upgrade the hardware so that you can run better software. That isn't to say that you shouldn't meditate. That isn't to say that you shouldn't use all of these other techniques and stuff. But um, the reality is, um, sit down and breathe. Let me see you, you know, fly to the moon. You know, if you have a ship, you're much more likely to make it. And this is the same thing. It's technology. You know, I'm sorry. You just... You can't outrun a Lamborghini because you have, you know, you're trying really hard or something. You just can't. You just can't. And she said it herself, you know, I couldn't actually achieve those states with just breath. No, you can't. <laughs> you never will. No one ever has. I don't care what they say. And there's also the fact that, um, you know, a lot of the people that push this DMT from breath release, um, it is a uh, complete nonsense. Um, the uh, myth that DMT is born when you die and, and, and when you're born is, and, and when you dream, REM sleep, there's more in your blood than, that was Rick Strassman theorizing. It was hypothetical. He was saying, I think it's possible and it became, you know, it got twisted into this urban legend. There's not enough DMT in your entire body at any time to cause a psychoactive experience. It's not real. It doesn't mean that you can't have an altered state of consciousness from breathing. You definitely can. It's not DMT. So I'm not trying to discount other techniques and I'm not trying to invalidate things. I just think that, you know, I'm coming from the point of view of Illuminism and I, I, I think that that approach just makes the most sense that you know, we have to walk this balance of realizing we're in the material world. Things have a mechanistic basis. Things play out somehow. They have conduits of action. Like, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah, and we're trapped in a chemical reality as well. So, you know, I think bearing those things in mind um, <clears throat> and just being realistic, I find some of the, the attitudes um, expressed there to be a little bit archaic. Um, and I think it's time to... It, it, you know, it's a residual from the um, uh, bias, um, the cultural, what is the word, you know, where we, when something is taboo, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a residual from that, from this negative association that we're saying, oh, well, it's a crutch and you need to do it without it and all of this stuff. No, no, no. It's a tool, and what you will find if you go out into the nature is that if you try to make an arrowhead out of clay, it's not going to work very well. But if you get some, um, what is that black stuff, the lava glass, um, it's not absinthe. It's <laughs> you guys know what I mean? The black glass, uh, I just the name of it's escaping me, but the obsidian, you know, then you're going to have a hell of an arrow. It's the difference between breath work and psychedelics. And the thing is, breath work is safer. Breath work is easier. Uh, breath work does not require the skill set that using ayahuasca properly does. Breath work does not require you to prop yourself up with all sorts of other disciplines and traditions in order to get the most out of it. But there's a compensation for that. <laughs> you know, I mean... If you ride a bicycle and you wreck, you get a scraped knee. If you're driving a Lamborghini and you hit a cliff at 220 miles an hour, you die. And that's another one of the trade-offs, you know. Um, it's just risk versus reward equation. It's all, you know, that's just how it is.
So those were the three things that I wanted to mention. And I think everybody has different experiences. And uh, what we had on the table for discussion were several things, including um, the kind of ego inflation that can happen after uh, communing with, with these spirits. Um, and also the commodification, which is making it a very different experience now than it was uh, even in the 1970s or 80s. And, you know, this uneasy alliance between um, the Western practitioners and the indigenous, which can be in different forms of self-colonization, of appropriation, or of genuine syncretism, where these traditions are brought together because they each have something to show and they bear upon each other. So although I had a plan initially when we were talking outside, we said, let's just get rid of it and, uh, you know, let's speak by whoever feels called to pick up the thread next. So if there's any, like, immediate questions, uh, you can ask now. If not, we'll just pass it on and be surprised. Okay. All right, the next speaker is Andrew, and he is probably, of all of us, the best speaker of the night. Overall, he was the most coherent, and um, maybe I'm biased because a lot of the things that I was going to say, he said, and then I didn't have them to say anymore because I didn't want to be redundant. Um, but he is another example of where you know you can have a tremendous amount in common with someone, and then all of a sudden hit this incredible wall of divergence. And... It was a real trick for me to realize, you know, this is an ally with a profound amount of wisdom and there is like this one sticking point that for me is tremendous difficulty. Um, but in the end, of the, at the end of the day, it in no way diminishes my respect um, for his knowledge and um, I appreciate him tremendously. Um, and so it's something that I, I have to work through for the first time because I have never encountered anyone before with this Christian disposition that I also um, had that kind of respect for. So it's a kind of a new um, circumstance for me. Um, and we'll get into that more as he gets to talking, but I wanted to check in with the chat. By the way, you guys, do me a favor, hit the like button, share, subscribe, consider becoming a patron. I gotta go buy another mic now. Um, <laughs> consider becoming a patron. If you're not already right now, you can watch me. Um, I actually hurt myself a little bit. I went up into the, there's these ruins nearby. Um, and I think I mentioned this at the beginning, it was a tremendous hike. Uh, I was really blown away at how large the, the structures were. I wasn't, I thought they were just walls up there because they're kind of far and they look small from here. Um, but you know, there were artifacts laying around and it was really a wild, um, and I got, I got stabbed in my foot by a, a, some kind of cactus with a barb. And I think it might be a problem, actually. I, I, I got out part of it, but I left some in there, and it, like, really hurts to walk. So, um, not sure why. Oh, yeah, but that video is on the Patreon um, page. And then we have PayPal Zell, and, you know, if you're a Bitcoin millionaire, I would be a great person to just blow up with a nice surprise so that I can blow up and give you guys some more nice surprises. All right, so let's just, let's check out Andrew. Um, very um, well um, researched and um, profoundly wise bearded Santo Daime um, Ayahuasquero and uh, Christian esoteric adept I would probably go so far as to say so, whoever wants to pick up the thread. Uh, I'll go. Okay. okay. Hi, I'm Andrew. Uh, <clears throat> I'm coming with a background in um, Western esotericism and esoteric entheogenic Christianity. Uh, I study Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, and I also practice the Santa Daimi. 
I don't know if you, those who don't know, Santo Daime is an entheogenic Christian hermetic lineage where we work with ayahuasca, but it's consecrated as a Christian sacrament. I just want to interject real quick and say that there is a major point of divergence already because when I say hermetic, what I'm talking about is Thoth. I'm talking about, you know, Babylonia. Um, this strain of hermeticism is only traced back to the third century BC. Uh, uh, no, AD, excuse me, and um, is overtly Christian. Um, and to people from the older lineage, uh, we do not recognize that hermeticism as legitimate. In fact, we see it as a co-opting of the mysteries with the intention of trying to get straggling people from the herd back into the herd. So, you know, when I, I hope you guys understand, I'm not trying to be contentious about this. And I know he's 100% well-intentioned. But um, it is something that we really, you know, people from my side of the coin, um, we really, really, really um, take um, issue with, with this. Uh, so I want to talk about the Western lineage of entheogenic science. Like, uh, entheogens have always been used in the West as a, as a sacrament of the divine science, of a divine science. And there's always been a, an unbroken tradition of how to work with these uh, tools and these, these, these sacraments according to this divine science. And so I, I see basically two main themes or two main um, lineages. There's like various indigenous lineages that are passed on through ancestry. Uh, and there's various indigenous lineages, and then there's a kind of Western lineage, but the Western lineage is hidden. It's occulted, and it's very secretive. It's surrounded in, in secrecy, and there's a long history of persecution, which, which like, from the church. So this underscores, like, the reasons and the, the birth of the esoteric impulse to hide these things. So the Western lineage goes, traces its lineage back to the mystery schools, of ancient Egypt and you can even go further and say it goes back to Atlantis but like let's just say starting with with Egypt these were entheogenic schools of initiation and there was a very um, profound and elaborated divine science surrounding this process of initiation and there was as as um, Ariel was saying like there was always like a probationary period or like an actual uh, like a very serious period of preparation to prepare for the actual event of initiation and the event of initiation was an entheogenic event and something very specific happens in the higher bodies when this happens and uh, the preparation was absolutely essential and in in the ancient mysteries, there was also people were chosen. It wasn't like everybody could just walk into the pyramid and, and demand some mushrooms and get initiated, or uh, like it was. It was they were chosen based on the level of kind of um, perceived maturity and readiness. Now this this condition is changing in the times we're living in now, and that actually has profound implications, very profound implications. But in the history of entheogenic initiation. Uh, it was a very serious and very secretive thing. And um, this was like passed on in unbroken chains. And you had these, these bearers of this divine science that were always initiating. So there was always those who had been already initiated who could guide the initiate safely through the process. So that's really important to understand that in the West we've always had that. But then you have this 2,000 years ago, the advent of the, the, the Christ impulse and the Christ manifestation on earth. And then this happened in the context of mystery schools. And so something that not a lot of people know because this was actually concealed and, and this knowledge was persecuted by the church was that there was actually an, a, a lineage of entheogenic Christianity. And this was another initiation school, another like a tradition of entheogenic initiation. But this was badly hijacked. And, and, and so there was this like impulse on earth that was like kind of attacking entheogenic impulses and, and trying to dismantle and destroy this unbroken lineage of, of this divine science. And so this, this gave rise to esotericism, which is very, um, very quintessentially Western. Like the Western shamanic lineage, I, I say it's a Western shamanic lineage. People say, oh, the West doesn't have a shamanic lineage. But uh, it does, it's just, it's just evolved in this direction of esotericism. 
So, and to be perfectly clear about that, actually, the word shaman comes from salmon, which is sungus, and it's west, west, western culture. I mean, maybe near eastern, I don't know, Siberia, what is that? I mean, you know, but um, it's kind of crazy that people say that because if you look at around Europe, you know, you have the Druidic traditions and you have, <clears throat> Wicca actually isn't real. Um, the Harold Gardner made up that story because the publisher balked at the idea of crediting Aleister Crowley, uh, which is what actually happened. Harold Gardner went and interviewed Aleister Crowley for two weeks. He did not meet a coven of witches. There was no ancient tradition called Wicca. There, none of it's real. It's totally fake. Um, he just made up the story because the publisher was like, no, 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 we're not doing the whole Crowley thing. Then come on, you guys. Um, do as thou wilt and harm you none. Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is a law, love under will. I mean, it's like, you know, come on. Um, we, we, we call it Crowley for dummies, basically. Um, but, you know, what I'm saying is the real witch tradition, you know, the, the real wise woman, the herbal um, the vegetalista of Europa, you know, of Europe, um, is uh, definitely a shamanic tradition, you know. And we, I would even say that the uh, Hashishans and whatnot in, in the Middle East was a shamanic tradition. So sh the shamanic impulse is a global one. Um, there are even probably, uh, this is something I'm very interested in because it's never been really confirmed, um, is whether or not there's an aboriginal um, tradition in um, with I think it's a blue acacia or something in, in, and it's supposedly again super super secret and what he's saying about uh, you know the secret secrecy in the hermetic tradition um, or the mystery tradition and the the, um, the the shamanic archetype I guess, the shuar in the shuar in uh, in Ecuador and northern Peru are also extremely secretive. Like they have a plant uh, mixture that is made from this plant. You can find it on my channel somehow somewhere. Um, and the the skin of it looks like a um, dosekis, the very venomous fertilance. The um, it's like a smaller bushmaster, but more venomous. Um, and the, the leaves look like drooping snake heads. And so um, that is the, the main plant, but there are other plants. And it is said that if you're bitten by one of these snakes, there's like a 100% chance that you're going to need an amputation. In fact, even if you're in the city, um, I, I saw a video about a girl who was in Colombia and got bitten uh, and she had to have her leg removed. She was only 15 minutes from the hospital. If the schwar give you these plants, you will not need an amputation, but they will not tell us what goes in it. Um, and only the elect of the shuar, the, the young boys and girls that are, are the smartest and the most um, trustworthy, um, the, the only, not even to become a shaman, but just to learn about the plants, there is an elect. Um, there was one other point that he made that I would like to refute because it's very important to me. Um, he said the Christ manifestation on earth, I would say that the historical record is 100% conclusive that there was no such thing. Um, there's not a single uh, written record. There's not, you know, people kept diaries back then. Um, the Roman consulate was extremely anal. They tracked everything, every single trial, every arrest, every execution. Even if there was an attempt at a cover-up, the chances that every single one of those documents would disappear, um, that there's not a single spy. I mean, the, the consulate had spies all over Rome, anally recording everything. Um, there's no record of a Jew wandering around and preaching to big groups. And also the fact that we can tell how the myth was composed, what, where the pieces came from. Um, and this is another point of um, conflict for the older mystery lineage, uh, because as the Kabbalion says, the original impulse of the Gnosis came from Babylonia, and then it became all the world religions, and it was corrupted, and it was turned to the purposes of the overlords, especially Christianity and Islam. Um, and they took the knowledge of the mystery, and they cloaked it in myth, and they added all these corruptions and stuff. And what happened? 2,000 years of war, bigotry, oppression, 
torture, genocide, cultures wiped off the face of the earth, the Catholicization of South America and the eradication of all of the ancient beliefs that had been there before, the burning of all the books of the Maya. Um, and without this perturbation, without this inculcation of Jesus and Allah into the original impulse of the mysteries, none of that shit would have happened. Because in the pure religion of light, if it's a religion, it's just knowledge that consciousness comes from light, matter is light, everything's light, and that's the basis of it. There's no dogma, there's no doctrine, there's no name for God exactly. I mean, you'll see him cringe later when I'm talking, and I say there are no gods in the mysteries. What I should have said is there are no gods in the Illuminism lineage of the mysteries. Okay, but I'm sure you can see what I'm saying here. From our point of view, it was the cultural appropriation, which oddly enough is a theme of this talk, uh, that resulted in all of the disasters that uh, all these religions wrought and continue to to this day. They continue to oppress, they continue to destroy, they continue to corrupt. Um, and our entire, um, um, what is the French word for reason, raison d'etre or some shit like that, <laughs> our reason to exist, uh, is basically to try to undo all that and eradicate all of these religions from the face of the earth. Um, and, it, you know, people think that it's like a troll on some epic level or that, you know, we're being um, somehow, you know, respect people's beliefs and shit. And it's like, no, man, these beliefs do not respect anything. That, you know, I mean... The, the, the suffering and death, if, 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 if <clears throat> you consider the number of deaths just by the numbers that uh, Christianity has caused, it is more than all of the uh, dictators in human history. So, you know, it, when, it, when someone is an apologist for this religion and they say, but he taught good morals, like, what, what do you mean, the stuff my son understood at birth? Because he hasn't been corrupted, he still knows he's never heard of Jesus. You know, Satan may come as an angel of light. What about that? You know, what about John warning just before Jesus shows up saying this, this angel's going to come. Jesus, I'm sent by God. So he's an angel. I am the light. Wait a minute. Weren't we just warned ex exactly to watch out for exactly that? Beware a wolf in sheep's clothing. You, you mean the, the one they call the lamb? That one? That guy? Oh, oh, wait, Lucifer. Lucifer's ego and evil. And you mean the... The guy that was not a, a spiritual enemy of the Jews, but a political one that was a, a rival of the guy that wrote Ezekiel. And so he changed the, the line, Ben Chalel, son of mourning, to Lucifer. It's not even a mistranslation. It just doesn't exist. Um, but nevertheless, uh, Lucifer or morning star is used to describe Lucifer in Ezekiel. And Jesus calls himself the morning star in Revelation. What is that about? Tell me. What the fuck is that about? And believe me, there's more. There's plenty, plenty more. You know, the adepts that engineered the Bible also knew how the mind works and how it works in symbols. And they also knew, being adepts of the mysteries, that uh, the light bearer, which is what Lucifer um, actually translates to, is actually the oscillation of the wave. It's the oscillating wave. That gives rise to the light, which gives rise to consciousness. And so when you demonize Lucifer, the symbol of the light bearer, you demonize consciousness itself and therefore enslave the entire human race. So, um, I, you know, I hope it's clear to you guys why we have a bit of a bone to pick and why we don't like it when people inculcate Christianity into the mystery lineages. It's not cool. And so and this is like surrounded by secrecy and occultism and secret societies eventually gave rise to the phenomenon of secret societies. And so when, when people today feel this innate call to initiation and they don't, they can't, they just, they, they feel something deep in their soul that's calling them to an entheogenic initiation. Normally in North America or Europe or South America, they go seeking and they find mushrooms. Is usually the first major entheogen or cannabis. And they have the experiences on their own without elderhood, without guidance, without a mentor. And you can go a certain, you can go so far on your own and there's a certain protection up to a certain point on your own. 
But then at a certain point, I feel, I personally feel that at a certain point it's necessary to find lineage and, and elderhood. To guide, because there's, in initiation, there's these thresholds that we have to pass. It's like when we're, when we're going and being initiated into the spiritual world, there's these thresholds. It's not just one world, like, boom, we enter, we take the antigen, we're in the spirit world. There's very, it's like a complex world and there's various thresholds. And first of all, we need orientation about the cartography of these worlds. Like there's thresholds, there's beings that protect the thresholds, there's tricksters that deceive us with their own shadows. There's all sorts of things that, that we need to be aware of as we're navigating. And it's the elders who have this divine science that are bearers of this divine science that give us the keys to cross over the thresholds. So this this was very badly attacked in the West, like the elderhood, like entheogenic shamanic elderhood was like severely persecuted. And so Westerners growing up today, they feel this like uh, this innate call to entheogenic initiation, but they don't know where to go for elderhood. They intuitively sense, I, I, I really need an elder, a shaman of some sort to, to initiate me properly because it's dangerous. I respect this is very serious. And they don't know where to go. There's no like indigenous Westerners. So, so the, we're in this situation where we go to indigenous peoples who have unbroken chains, who have the divine science still, who haven't lost it. Uh, but this brings in another complication because I feel that the, the, the impulse of initiation emerges and, and those, those who are feel called to be initiated, it's to be of service to their civilization. And so the, it, the way that we get trained to be of service to our civilization is really contingent on the unique karma of our civilization and the unique wounds and traumas of our civilization. So to use the metaphor of shamanism, like each like sh like shamanic individual, I don't think that shamans can only be like indigenous people. I think it's an archetypal phenomenon and it emerges in different cultures with different expressions, but it follows the same archetypal structure and it usually begins like with a crisis. There's like some sort of wound that needs to be healed, some sort of illness that needs to be healed. The candidate goes on a journey to heal this wound and they go through a kind of soul retrieval process. They retrieve what's missing, they heal this wound, and then they become specialists in addressing this unique wound. Uh, and so Westerners have a unique wound. Westerners have, have faced the persecution of shamanic wisdom, the, the persecution of, of entheogenic wisdom, and we've lost elderhood, and we've, 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 we've re, like kind of experienced deep soul loss because the mystical, Gnostic, direct communion mysteries have been removed. And we've been given this like materialism and, and all sorts of, it's getting even worse and worse now. So we have this wound where we need to go and retrieve a direct connection. And so uh, in order to like achieve that, we're, we're, looking, we're looking for entheogens, but we don't know where to find our elderhood. So one of the things that I like to emphasize is that Westerners really do have an entheogenic lineage in the, what we call hermeticism and alchemy. If you look at the work of the alchemists, most people don't realize that alchemists were the specialists in entheogens. They were taking entheogens and developing a divine science of what happens to your soul when you do this, and these stages of transformation that you, that you engage in when you take these entheogens. And they had a doctrine. It's the doctrine of the great work, the doctrine of the Philosopher's Stone. This is a doctrine of doing alchemy on your higher body so that you can achieve this kind of initiatory state. So there's an actual objective to using using entheogens and there's like a there's a successful process of working with it but on the other side there's actually like full of dangers and and we really rely on elders to protect us from these dangers. So westerners are like we don't have western elders of our own and then but when we go to indigenous elders they have this shamanic impulse that was born and evolved out of the needs of their civilization, out of the traumas of their civilization. So I feel that there's this phenomenon of like shamanic identity crisis where we go and we train with, with, with shamans from, from different civilizations and then we do our best earnestly to try to like plant it in our Western civilization but something is missing because shamanism ought to really emerge out of the civilization that it's meant to serve because that's how the impulse evolves. Like there's a crisis in the tribe and like the shaman is the one who solves that crisis. And
So that is um, a profoundly important point, and it's something that a lot of people hesitate to actually um, discuss, and he just kind of touched on it, which is why I'm elaborating a little bit. But um, statistically, uh, people that get themselves into trouble, it happens with indigenous shaman. And also, I have, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I've had a number of people tell me that they've been to, you know, traditional people and that they got no help and that I was able to help them. And that's because I come from the same culture. And I would not be so effective without the influence of those indigenous people that shared their knowledge with me. And so I honor them and I appreciate them and I acknowledge them um, <clears throat> and I even preserve a lot of their traditions. And as soon as the medicine begins to work and the ceremony is open, all of the spirits are real and I'm in their world. And um, when um, the uh, curtain closes at the end of the night, I'm not so sure anymore about those spirits and whatnot. Um, and it works that way, you know. Um, but what, what I'm getting at there is that it is true that for people that are, are coming from a Western civilization, and we have a much more complex set of aberrations and traumas and confusion, uh, and people in the jungle do not have these influences. I mean, things are very, very simple and straightforward, and um, there can be certain expressions of complexity in the culture for sure, um, but the dynamics that people are, are in, interfacing with are not anything like what we deal with in Western culture. Um, in fact, watching Western culture bleed in through people's cell phones and whatnot. Um, uh, another interesting aspect of this actually is that if you live in the jungle, you'll notice that the further away from the towns you get, the more um, healthy the indigenous communities are. So if you're right around Misawali or whatever, you know, there's tons of alcoholism. There's, you know, spousal abuse everywhere, incest, all kinds of, it's, it's bad. You know, it's pretty bad. Um, but you go a little further out and everything's fine. So that is a really good examination. It's almost like radiation or something. You know, when you're at ground zero, you're doomed. You're, you're full of it. And that's us. You know, and then you go to these indigenous cultures, and I think they're they they were so sensitive and unprepared for the emanations of this energy coming at them from the modern society. In fact, one of the Warani um, tribes, the uncontacted Warani, uh, the same ones that actually, if you guys have seen at the tip, uh, I think it's called the movie where that's about when they speared the missionaries. Um, those Warani came to Miss Wali all of a sudden. And it must have been a crazy day because everything's business as usual and then all of a sudden, you know, a hundred canoes full of Warani, completely naked Warani with spears walk up on the beach. There's tourists everywhere, like, you know, totally normal day. And people are just going like, what is happening? You know, this is uncontacted people. And they said so they looked around and they got back in the canoes and they left and they had one person that was an intermediary that was community that spoke wow a little bit. They ended up killing her. Um, and she, uh, because of Christianity and, um, they, uh, they told her to go and tell the, the town that they were going to make contact. But when they saw it, they, they just knew that they should, um, they didn't even have to discuss it. They just got in the canoes and left. Um, so yeah. And you know, another point I wanted to make is that you might be asking, what is the point of taking issue with the Christian position? If this man is saying everything I would say, if I was sitting there, like it's exactly, <laughs> it is exactly what I all, I mean, you guys know me, if you follow my channel, this it sounds just like me, you know, a little bit different, but basically it's the same exact message and the same, you know, I mean, there's almost nothing I take issue with, uh, except for there are a couple of statements about entities and stuff that I don't really. Um, but the, here's the thing, you guys. It's not about him. It's not about him. For 99.99% .99 of people, Christianity is an impediment. And we can do everything that we can do without it. So where is the wisdom in keeping it? inculcating it into systems where it is not necessary. You know, you don't need Jesus not to tell you to throw rocks at hookers. 
You don't need Jesus to tell you to love your neighbor. You know, you're not going to do it whether he tells you to or not. You know, so all of these negative side effects of this religion do not valid. You know, there's no reason for it. It's just not necessary. We all know what good morals are. That's, you know, you don't need to be taught that. You just, it's just whether you choose to ignore it or not. So that's the thing. You know, I appreciate this man 100%. Um, but anytime I encounter this, especially when it's encroaching upon what I consider my territory, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. And, you know, Andrew, if you happen to watch this, um, and I, I would be happy to actually debate, I'm going to try to get him to debate me in, in live and, and, you know, we'll have another talk and just debate openly. Um, <clears throat> and by the way, this was Ariel's idea in case you're wondering why I'm you know, she suggested that I stream it and, and, and do this. Um, but in case you're, you're, you're watching, Andrew, I would suggest that maybe you consider why is it that your ayahuasca practice is associated with the church and your mystery lineage is also I I integrated with a religion. You know, I, to me, that's telling. And um, from my point of view, with, you know, absolute good intention um, and love and respect, I think it's it's something worth examining because, in my opinion, we need to eradicate all of these things from um, the face of the planet to the point where they're burned so black they're beyond the power of human memory to recall them. Becomes a healer for that for that group with that specific problem. So I feel that we're really in this like identity crisis situation where Westerners feeling this the shamanic calling to be entheogenically initiated don't know where to go. There's nothing in the West, and, and there's it's it's complicated with indigenous cultures, and so we're looking, and we're trying our best. But now we have this phenomenon of charlatanism that's emerging, where like where now we have like. Uh, people that are self-initiated and this is the first time in history in the history of humanity where entheogens are widely available widely available to basically anybody that wants to try them this has never been the case it's always been very fiercely guarded secret knowledge and you can be killed even if you were like speaking about it like openly it was very seriously guarded at least in the western mystery schools and this is the first time in history that entheogens are widely available but there's no like initiatic uh, uh, traditions to make sure that people are prepared. Now people can show up like, oh, I want to I wanna try ayahuasca. And then they, they walk down the streets of Pisac and they, they find a shaman that very same day and that night they're, they're drinking ayahuasca. And like, it is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. And like, there, we can get into the science. I don't know if we're going to get into this, but there's this whole science of like the deceptions that we have to face when we haven't done enough shadow work, where we're carrying our own unconscious shadows into the experience. Our own shadows get animated, and then they confront us, and we think they're entities. And there's all sorts of discernment that's needed that we really rely on elders to give us this, give us and help us with this. So While he's on the subject, actually, I, I, I want to give an example of how this kind of stuff happens. Earlier I talked about how the shaman or the psychic may give you something that you want to believe and then once you know you you are invested in believing the next thing they tell you because you want to believe the first thing they told you and so now they tell you that you have a spiritual attachment and you have to pay them to get rid of it uh even worse i was actually talking to an incredibly wise and intelligent young woman um yesterday who was present at this um event and um she described to me something that i have encountered many times where um, the shaman using his telepathy, which could be real, you know, you never know, even if they have bad intention, it doesn't even necessarily mean that they're fake, <laughs> which is the really scary part. Um, but she reminded me of this, um, that people, these, these shamans and other types of crooked healers will tell people they have cancer or something. And if they have even if it's by pure chance, and you have to admit that it always could be, if someone says to someone, well, you have cancer and it's here, and then the cancer happens to go into remission, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the shaman really knew it was there and that he really cured it. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, so there's that. But once he has had one of these coincidences or successes, then he has um, leverage, he has weight with people. And so he tells someone, that they have cancer and they could believe it enough that they actually develop cancer. 
So you have to be extremely cautious. Um, this person was uh, luckily wise, um, but not unaffected by this, you know, wise enough to question it, but not unaffected. Um, <clears throat> and so that's, you know, very disturbing to, to me to realize because if it was me, I have very powerful intuition, you know, I do know things sometimes. Um, thus it's not like I just know everything or, or that I'm always 100% correct, but for sure I know things sometimes. But even if I thought that I knew something about someone for sure, like that they had cancer, I would go about it in a way that they are not, you know, aware that I am, you, you know what I mean? You would use subtlety and um, tact in order to not place an idea in someone's mind that could be false. So, um, you know, what he was saying about how walking down the street and finding a shaman, you know, that kind of thing, it's even worse because you could have someone that had a, a, a coincidental success and therefore has established a good reputation because if it was something like cancer, that one coincidental success is going to seem very large. So, um, you know, caution is the word out there, guys. So, but I just want to impress that the importance of understanding that the West really does have its own indigenous, like Western entheogenic lineage, but it has this long history of being occulted and being distorted and being attacked. And so it went underground. And now is this time to kind of like reclaim it and uh, this is kind of where my own work comes in, and this is what I've dedicated a lot of my life to, is like reclaiming this kind of um, Rosicrucian, alchemical, entheogenic lineage for the science of initiation. So that's what I want to say. Thank you. Well, bravo. I mean, that was really solid, you know. And what he's saying right there is a, it was an extremely well-engineered um, dissertation on... Uh, um, elucidation uh, and pontification upon the state of our most great and glorious plan to illuminate the planet through the means of entheogenic transformation and mystery lineage initiation. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm 100% on board. <clears throat> I would just like to convince him to leave Jesus out of it. And also, for the record, I'm not a huge fan of Santa Daime, or however you say it. I'm not going to get into uh, all the reasons, but I think that making a church of ayahuasca is a horrific thing to do. Um, it's, you know, any time that you create a religion around something, you have fucked up. Um, you know, in the beginning, God made the light. Shortly thereafter, he made man. Shortly after that, he made woo-man. But then, God made a big mistake. He fucked up. He invented the poodle. <laughs> all you Zappa fans out there, all two of you definitely are laughing right now. The rest of you are like, what the fuck is he talking about? Okay, so the next speaker, we're only 28 minutes out of two hours and five minutes because I've been talking so much. Um, but we're going to power through this and then it'll be like this like, you know, 12 hour um, thing that you guys can chew through at your leisure over the next 15 years or <laughs> whatever. Um, but do hit the like button, share, subscribe, uh, consider supporting me on Patreon or through one of the options in the chat. And then also, um, I'm going to check in with the chat. I see Alpha Draconian has had an awful lot to say. Yeah, weed is very expansive. It opens you up. Um, it just gives me anxiety. I don't really see, um, Illuminostic Life, you made another channel already? Way to go. Um, everybody go, sub go subscribe to that because, um, I don't know what you want me to call you. I'll call you a luminostic life, um, is kind of a sister channel. And we did a, 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 a stream the other day on that channel and then it got deleted the whole channel. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think she'd gotten up to like, you know, a hundred subscribers or something. And, and so we need to make up all that ground, um, because I'm demonetized. That's why I'm always asking you guys for support. I don't get any, um, Anything from YouTube. 
Yeah, the shamanic traditions are the originals, and the religions are derivative of that, but they're worse than just a derivative. Well, I appreciate that natural state, but I, I kind of disagree. I mean, you know, I, I really felt at home with them because I'm usually the odd man out completely instead of just on a few points, <laughs> you know. Um, I am really just so fed up with the plastic um, spiritual, you know, the consumer, like it's all engineered for marketability and, 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 and scaling and sales and stuff, you know, just like all the religions are, you know, that's another issue with Jesus. Um, the idea that you can put all of your shit on um, some zombie and then you're free uh, is complete bullshit. There's nothing. I mean, then I realize that people are supposed to follow the commandments and be good also. But the reality is that most of them, well, no matter what they say to your face, just they they just use the the clause that oh well I've given my whatever what does that even mean I've given my soul to Jesus what the fuck are you even talking about you know and the way they think the name is like you know it's this name it's we're branded so that's the thing the name of God you know it's like it's it's literally everything like what the fuck are you talking about it's it's you know I'm, so I I just I hope you know I hate to think that people out there think that I'm just being like you know contentious but it is it's a big deal to me um and i don't think i'm wrong at all um you know people say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. okay well you know there's some kind of consciousness integrated into the fabric of the universe be a good person didn't need jesus for that you know that's the whole shit right so what are you talking about <laughs> But we, the baby is Jesus, baby Jesus. <laughs> I mean, um, the, 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 well, yeah, keep the bathwater, I guess, in this case. You know, normally you would want to keep the baby and throw the bathwater out, but we need to do the opposite. <laughs> bravo, bravo. <Yeah. laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to talk next. Uh, my name is Janet Jaramillo. I'm from Ecuador. And, uh, I've been walking this medicine path for, should I put it here, just a little bit. So I've been walking the medicine path for 14 years. I came to Peru in 2010 and immediately I started living at the Nayahuasca Healing Center. And um, yeah, I feel my, my heart beating very fast. So my where I come from is from this interception between plant medicine and Buddhist practices. Mm. So I've been um, a Buddhist for the past 10 years. I have trained with Jack Cornfield and Tara Brock in mindfulness. And I've been working in an organization called Lotus Vine Journeys who merges these uh, practices of awakening, practices of being present, practices of embodiment into a the view of how we work with plant medicine. The first three years that I work with ayahuasca at a very famous, I live at a very famous ayahuasca healing center named uh, the Temple of the Way of Light. So um, I had all this incredible awakening experience, a lot of healing experience, but uh, I didn't realize until I went to my first 10 days meditation retreat, I didn't realize how much my mind was actually blocking the real healing experience. Uh, meaning, there is a lot of that we think our minds are, is real. And not all the time our thoughts are something that we should listen and follow. So since I've been following this, uh, the Buddhist path, this has uh, allowed me to connect to this wisdom of the body, the embodied wisdom. And uh, to just observe, to be an observer of the mind. And I take these teachings to uh, the way I work with the medicine. Something that is very important for me is uh, in the Buddhist path, the main uh, reason the main purpose of the buddhist path is to 
doctrine. It's the doctrine of the great work, the doctrine of the philosopher's stone. This is a doctrine of doing alchemy on your higher body so that you can achieve this kind of initiatory state. So there's an actual objective to using using entheogens, and there's like a there's a successful process of working with it. But on the other side, there's actually like full of oh, danger. Man. Did I just accidentally rewind that a bunch? I'm sorry, guys. And the uh, healing is incredible. Three months retreat in silence all day, meditating from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yeah. over and over and over again. And uh, not many people have this uh, this lucky the time, the resources, and uh, the healing that you can experience going through this time of period of deep meditation is a lot. But you need months and months and months of practice with the medicine. There is incredible amount of. Uh, removing traumas that can happen in very short time. So the way I work with the medicine and the way I see these plants, I trust there is a divine uh, calling. I trust that there is a divine kind of like energy that wants to align to what we already are. So in the Buddhist tradition would be like, we are already uh, we are healed, we are already perfect, we have forgotten. And there is a part of us that is always going to be pulling towards healing. Even when we do crazy things, there is a part of us that is always going to be a kind of like pulling towards healing. And I feel like as a humans right now, this unconscious part of us that is pulling towards healing is looking for these medicines and I feel very strongly that these medicines are coming to us because we need them at this time. The most important for me is how we can make this process of a connection between indigenous people, between these sacred medicines, between western people the most uh, safe possible without condemning I think like I am not any person that is going to condemn the industry or how if the person has the right intention. Who am I to say? You have the right intention. You are not having the right intention. I cannot say um, what happens if somebody comes with curiosity and decides to have an ayahuasca ceremony that day, if that is not the way for them to change their life. So um, for me, it's like how can... How can I, what can I do so I can minimize harm? So people can uh, come to the medicine feeling, prepare, as prepared as they can, and knowing what is a harmful place, where should we go, especially for women, what interactions are not okay, what is, um, yeah, that is kind of like the most important thing for me. I'm pretty practical, so, and. Uh, and like releasing trauma, talking from the lenses of trauma healing, talking from the lenses of deep connection between uh, us and nature and our deeper self, that is the most important for me. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, <laughs> that's it. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing that comes to mind immediately is how much fucking trauma do we really have? Like, how loosely are we using this word? Because, you know, I, I can see how, like, I had moments in my life where, you know, trauma doesn't have to be, like, a brick to the face. It doesn't have to be seeing somebody shot in the stomach. It doesn't have to be, I don't need to go on. Um, <laughs> it doesn't need to be all of this crazy stuff. It can be, you know, my mother screaming in my face, that I don't deserve ice cream because she's too broke to afford ice cream when I'm four. And then I feel like I don't deserve anything for the rest of my life. Like I get it. There can be these like things that qualify as trauma. But one of the things that I haven't mentioned throughout this is that my kind of confidence, I guess, level in plant medicine in general has kind of been shaken over the last uh, couple of years and it's not that I don't think it's effective. It definitely is. And, and research shows it's like 85% more effective than pretty much every arena than our uh, tradition, not traditional, but um, 
standardized protocol, you know, the, the, um, the, um, standard methods of treatment, um, you know, but just this, this recent split with my partner made me acutely aware of, um, a tremendous amount of stuff that I had chosen to ignore and that, uh, had, it had not that it had remained invisible, but I, I, that's not, that doesn't really happen. Um, but definitely choosing to ignore it. Um, and almost to the point of it being invisible or something. It's like, it's, it's difficult to explain, but <clears throat> the point being, if this medicine is intelligent and it has our best interest in mind, then even to, regardless of my years and years and years of experience with it and also training my mind, you know, I started rigorously training my mind for mindfulness when I was like a kid, really, and analyzing everything I do. And I'm very good at it. Um, but you know what I mean? Uh, it, nothing, none of this really totally was able to intersect with my ability to um, engage selective perception if I really felt like I had to. Now, we are talking about love here, which apparently, um, you know, according to all of the poets and the songs and everything, um, it does weird shit to your brain. But th especially if, as in my case, you had never experienced it before um, in any form, romantic or otherwise. So, um, I don't know if I'm making excuses, but the point is that people that, you know, my, my upbringing was way crazier in a negative way than the overwhelming majority of people. And when I see like these middle-class people that are on their 350th ayahuasca ceremony, and they're like, oh, yeah, I have all this beautiful healing and puking up all my trauma and stuff on it. It's like, dude, 362 ceremonies? Like, ooh, at what point, you know, are you all better? Um, and you could say that, that we continue to accumulate stuff over the course of a day, even. Um, but, you know... Um, we definitely have to be objective about this stuff. And I, I'm not redacting anything that I've said about, you know, enhanced intelligence and becoming a better version of yourself. And I definitely have clients that would, you know, they, they, their, their testimonials are on my channel. I'm still in contact with a lot of them, you know, and it doesn't save everyone though. You know, um, we definitely, definitely have seen people not be saved also, you know, um, I guess it just really comes down to being realistic. Like I was saying earlier about, you know, this is real life and, um, there, there's no storybook endings to anything. Um, and these, these tools are extraordinary and they're amazing experiences even just to have for the experience and, and not even in the context of, of healing. You know, in fact, ayahuasca, a lot of people say, well, how could you even say that you should take ayahuasca and it's not for healing? Ayahuasca was not used for healing until 1993, except for in the case where the shaman would drink it and try to heal someone. But mostly he was trying to find out where to hunt, where the enemy was. He was trying to get information. That's what ayahuasca is for, getting information, <laughs> really, traditionally, you know, so... Um, I guess, you know, the main thing is, is just you have to have a realistic approach and you have to have um, auxiliary support system, you know. And I'll be brutally honest <clears throat> because, of course, with this major change in my life, I've had to analyze and say, okay, well, what, what, what happened? Like, why wasn't I paying attention? Like, where, what, where did I let my guard down? And I realized that it was because... I had put in so much work. I had spent so many years analyzing that I haven't been violent in 25 years. Um, I haven't been a dangerous person in 25 years. Uh, <clears throat> you know, that the, the progress that I had made was so significant that um, I stopped really paying attention because I didn't realize how much further I had to go. That, you know, it's not enough not to be dangerous anymore. What about being emotionally available? I don't even know what the fuck that is really, you know, um, <laughs> you know, and I understand that now. Um, but you know what I mean? Um, 
the fact that I had trained myself for, for mindfulness in so many ways, but I'd realized that since I had done this entirely on my own, I had some say in where I was being mindful and where I wasn't. So I was able to engineer my own um, consciousness, but in, in, in accordance with certain predilections. So, um, you know, it's, it, we're very complicated creatures. And um, basically what I'm saying is that all the progress that I had made and all the work that I had put in and all the development, I could see the results of and I could see the effects. Also being able to help other people so well, you know, gave me a false sense of security in my own self. And then I let my guard down for years and years and years and years and years. Um, so um, I guess the bullet point of this presentation is, and it's kind of the point of this talk, is that there is so much more to this than plant medicine. Um, it's a major, major constituent, and it is vitally important. And I would say it's the most essential tool that we have, not just in terms of healing trauma and all this hippie shit people are always going on about, but also in terms of you know evolving our consciousness and um, becoming more creative and you know pushing the envelope and taking the human race a step forward. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot to be done. And one of the reasons that it's so complicated is because we've had so many negative influences. So, um, anyways, maybe I'm rambling. Let's give, uh Oh, you know what? I think I'm the next speaker. <laughs> Well, uh, I am deeply impressed. Um, there has been a lot of profound wisdom that has been shared today, and I'm honestly a little bit surprised. And it's also occurred to me how much we can have in common and still have points of divergence that are not merely minor points of faith or differences of practice. I come from a lineage of the mysteries um, a lot of people refer to as Illuminism. And just for example, uh, we are not friendly to the idea of inculcating Christianity into the mysteries and the impulse of the Gnosis. So it really struck me as interesting that we had so many profoundly common points. In fact, there's little even left for me to say in a way because I agree so much with much of the rest. And I think that it's sort of poetic, in a sense, that one of the reasons we're here is this necessity to integrate sometimes opposing um, traditions. And so... You see how uncomfortable I am having to say all that, you know? It really... And I was also thrown off because he said so much of, you know, that was my plan to talk about the Western mysteries and the in fact that we have a lineage of shamanism. And, you know, so I was like, damn, man, I really um, kind of have to scramble. To <laughs> but, yeah, it was really un uncomfortable. You notice I'm not really looking at anyone. I'm kind of um, just staring at the carpet. <laughs> my background, um, <laughs> before I was a YouTuber, I was an outlaw pot grower. And before that, I was born into biker gangs and violence and no indoor plumbing and um, lived outside of society pretty much my entire life. And when the marijuana industry collapsed, the outlaw industry in Northern California, I went to Ecuador. And as a child, I'd become very fascinated with the Amazon, particularly the Shuar and Warani people, who I ended up living with totally accidentally. Um, and at one point, I, I never desired to become a shaman. I didn't want to become a facilitator. I've never been to a retreat. I would never go to a retreat. Um, I started drinking with a Czech shaman who had been working with a uh, Schwar shaman. And they do not advertise to this day. You will not find them on the internet. You will never visit a retreat. You will never hear my teacher's, my original teacher's name. The, his teacher's name is Miguel Chiriop, and he doesn't mind. He's on a little bit on YouTube and stuff. Um, but I did not ask for an apprenticeship. I did not pay anyone. They still only charge 30 or $40 per person for ceremony. So I have this perspective of being kind of outside of society and then completely naive to the ayahuasca industry 
but I've been studying plant medicine book study since I was in sixth grade because of the accident. What I was really trying to get at there is that I was going to say that I, I almost considered declining this because I don't know how to tell you to um, acclimate Western society to plant medicine. I don't want to do that. I think that the, the fact that people are trying to use psychedelics to make people more well-adjusted to a fucking completely toxic, fucked-up lunatic asylum is blasphemous sacrilege. I'm not trying to help with that. <laughs> so if that's what we're here for, you know, I should probably leave. I mean, you know what I mean? And I just, I, I guess I was so thrown off by the energy of like min min the sort of conflict with the Christianity and the fact that he had said so many of the things that I, I intended to say that I've like missed entire points and I just kind of like jumped over them. But that's true. I, I hate that. And we also have the, um, the pharmacological... Um, you know, the big pharma trying to remove the transcendental experience from the, the, the medicine by making pills that are psilocybin without visions as if that's helpful. Um, you know, the efficacy of the medicine comes in large part from the, uh, um, the transcendental experience. And so what are they doing? What do they think they're doing? You know, the thing is, they're thinking, okay, well, we can enhance neurogenesis and, 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 and neuroplasticity, and then we'll be able to help people's brains, and, you know, that's cool, but if the brain doesn't have the direction from the transcendental experience, uh, how to program itself, it's just going to make a bunch of weird wiring, and you're not going to do anything but just, just fry people's brains, like, it's not... You know, so that that was really my point that I don't think we should be trying to, um, you know, and I think also one of the reasons that I kind of backed away from that is because I realized that's not really what they're up to here, um, you know, but it is something that I see happening that really bothers me, you know, that in the 1960s, uh, Timothy Leary's slogan was actually tune in, turn on, drop out, take over. It, it wasn't just tune on, turn in, drop out. I think he got scared <laughs> after a while. Um, but you know what I mean? Like, we were not back then trying to um, acclimate to society and be well adjusted people. People fucking microdosing to go to work. Really, dude? We're taking shrooms now to go be better fucking cubicle puppets? Like, what the fuck are people talking about? You know? This, this is just like. Uh, I, I wish that I had a big enough hand to bitch slap the entire Bay Area right now. You know what I mean? I just, I, I just, I can't take it anymore. I don't know why this world keeps turning round and round, but I wish it would stop and let me off right now. I mean, you know, I just, I, I can't anymore. Help me. It's a digital introduction of a plant a book about plant medicine into the elementary school library. <laughs> so I've been looking at this since there was no ayahuasca industry, which has revealed a lot in terms of things people claim to be traditional that are not. And um, people that maybe have, say, a vegan agenda that have um, maybe set the tone for um, what is believed to be standardized protocol that absolutely is not. So those sort of distortions. Um, but I'm... One thing I was going to mention there also is that, you know, not only are vegans, like, you know, they're running the retreats and stuff. So they're like, Pachamama wants us to all only eat carrots and fucking whatever this thing is. I have no idea what that is. I got it at, at the market and it looks like a French tickler and it kind of tasted like a celery. Like, you guys probably, some of you thought I was just straight up eating Datura pods like it was no big deal. <laughs> no, man, not tonight. Um... But what I was going to say about that is that, you know, this, this, aside from like vegans bullshitting because Schwar will eat a monkey and drink ayahuasca and then eat more monkeys when the medicine wears off. Um, then Pachamama doesn't get mad. Pachamama, the ayahuasca supposedly taught them how to shrink heads, how to make sansas. You know what sansas are? Sansas are shrunken heads where they take the skin off of the skull and shrink everything and then sew the eyes and the whole nose. And they would take ayahuasca and then do this because you cannot, um, the sinsak is the, um, they're like arrows that the shaman will, you know, if you attack someone with them, they become ill. The shaman uh, or the shwar don't believe in natural illness. 
Um, so if someone gets sick, it's because they've been attacked uh, by Sinsak. And so you cannot, um, you cannot buy or you cannot, um, you have to acquire Sinsak from another shaman, right? You have to drink ayahuasca to control them, but you have to acquire them somehow from another shaman. So, you know, we have two, two sides to this coin. One of them, and I was going to say all of this, and I, I can't believe it just left my, my brain. The, um, but uh, there are two sides to this coin. Um, one of them is that, you know, preserving tradition is important in some sense. Um, and I once had a guy tell me that his maestro, um, that they had been having the same dieta for 5,000 years, cinco mil años. And I was like, verdad. <laughs> Pendejo. Um, ¿Qué es esta dieta? Pollo y arroz. Chicken and rice. <laughs> White rice. Arroz blanco. Sí. No hay. Aquí. En Perú. Doscientos años. No más. Two hundred years. Two hundred years. White rice and chicken in Peru. The fuck are you talking about? The traditional dieta was fish and plantains. <laughs> That's 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 it. Because guess what there is to eat here? Fish and plantains. You know what I mean? You would avoid maybe eating ma mahas or something. But nobody's been eating chicken and white rice for 5,000 years. Nobody knows their lineage for 5,000 years. Um, but here's another thing. We want to preserve tradition. So next time you're going to go to ayahuasca ceremony, go ahead. Pescado. Platano. Tradicional, típica. <laughs> um, but uh, do we really want to stick with the tradition? Because what do you think you traded for Sinsak? What do you think you traded? Women. So, you know, I'm not really 100% um, sure that the absolute preservation of tradition is appropriate because um, I don't really have a whole gaggle of women to be trading for Sensok. I mean, um, fresh out, as a matter of fact. I'm aware that I got very lucky that I feel like I found an avenue into um, ayahuasca that had not been influenced by the outside world. And um, some of them want to tell their clients, you need to wait a year before you come to the retreat. Two weeks dieta. No, two years. Two years. No sex, no meat. Two years. Not two weeks. This is going to do almost nothing. Um, they were never conquered by the conquistadors. They were never conquered by the Ashwar. They were never conquered by anyone. And... Another quick story, though, man. This almost got me kicked out of a village because <laughs> this 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 guy. One of you guys actually asked me, "Is that um, uh, it was Andrew? Um, I think his name was Jim. I'm pretty sure it was Jim. I should remember. He was kind of a colleague for a while, but he's a biologist that works in um, I don't know some jungle town in Ecuador that I used to go to this garden um, where." Uh, this Schwar woman, his wife, uh, he was a Canadian, I think, and he had a Schwar wife. <clears throat> and um, they had replanted all of this cattle land with uh, jungle plants, um, only from that area. And there was another one that was even more miraculous, marvelous, um, Puyo. Um, this guy had taken bags of sawdust and like whatever he decided was the good way to simulate the, you know, healthy uh, rainforest floor. And he brought them uh, 
two hundred bags a day by himself and like planted this whole replanted this whole rainforest. Like it was like like two hundred hectares or something. And eventually he got help. He was a retired banker. He retired pretty young and started working on this. Um, but this other garden, uh, the Schwar lady, and um, Jim, let's call him, was telling me that the Schwar were never conquered. Um, you know, they weren't conquered, but just what I just said. Um, and uh, his son walks up with a Jesus Christ t-shirt on, and I went, looking pretty fucking conquered to me. And I just couldn't help it. It just came out of my mouth. <laughs> Their initiatory process would probably kill Oops. most of the people in this room. <laughs> and so when we talk about how we're going to adapt um, our culture to you know, acclimatize ourselves properly in the preparation, preparatory stages of this medicine, we cannot generally do it in the way that the Shawar would. That's not an option for most of us. You are not going to acquire your Arutam by drinking tobacco at eight years old by the waterfall for four days. You are not going to drink Datura when you're 13. You're not going to do that. You can't do that. You're well past that point. So we have to have um, our own processes. And so the sink. Now, did you hear what I just said? That's true. That's true. Um, they take the, um, the, uh, kids, the boys like eight years old to the waterfall and fasting and drinking tobacco juice. Um, most white kids, man, you just, you would die, you know, uh, every now and then a white adult dies from it. Um, you know, if you told it, if you told it, Shuar, the drinking tobacco could kill you, be like, what? <laughs> Are you serious? Never seen that before. You mean Inky? That's what they call us, Inkies. Yeah, I think it comes from Inca. It's anyone that doesn't speak Shuar. It's a Inky. Um, and a shaman is actually a Wishin. It sounds very Japan Japanese. The language. It's kind of like if 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 Japanese the language took a big giant hit of DMT and then started trying to like be Japanese. <laughs> That's what Shuar sounds like. And the waterfalls are very sacred to them. You know, we would always go to the waterfall and smoke mapacho and, and commune with the water spirits. And, um, of course, you know, very skeptical of these uh, spirits. But I did see and hear something once um, where it appeared that this water spirit uh, had actually used the droplets of water to materialize. So there were like little bloop, 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 bloop like little lights going up the middle of what would be, I guess it's it's like bubble spine. And then it had like like the edges of the wood where the water was dripping down, it had kind of materialized in there and it was like making this bloop, bloop, like, but it's not like bloop, bloop, bloop. It's like, you know, an otherworldly version of that. So yeah, that was, that was fucking weird. But <laughs> anyways, um, that, so the, the tobacco at, at the, at the waterfalls, I mean, you know, the teacher, Miguel Chiriap, um, he, the Sunki Shuar clan, um, in Gualakiza, he every time he opened his mouth, man, it was a waterfall, waterfall, waterfall. They just that's all he talks about, you know, the shamans, because his mind's on the sacred and the sacred is the waterfall. So it's just always waterfalls, waterfalls, cascada, cascada, cascada. <laughs> always with the waterfalls. But um they go to the waterfalls with the eight year old boys and they drink hoping that they're gonna um be able to touch the uh, Arutam Wakani which is the ancestral spirit. There's different forms of Arutam, and um, they have to uh, acquire this, and you can lose it. So you might have to go through this ritual over and over again throughout your life of drinking all this tobacco for days and fasting. Um, so as I was saying, you know, this initiatory process isn't for most white folks. I mean, you're... Um, I actually don't know how to pronounce it. I know what plant it is, but I don't know how to pronounce the Latin. Um, you're supposed to do it at 13, but you have to do it in order to become a Uishin. Um And for most 13-year-old white kids, drinking Datura is out of the fucking question. You're not doing that at 13. You're just not. Especially not a dose that's going to cause visions. No, you're not. <laughs> So, 
Um, you know, that, that, so I'm just trying, you know, I'm just trying to like really elucidate the, the problem here with, um, and of course you could say, well, okay, that's the schwar. You don't have to do it the schwar way. You could do it the shipibo way and then you're fine. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. There are gentler ways in, I guess. Um, still though, you know, it's, um, as Andrew was very wisely, um, uh, pointing out, I think that, you know, we need to adapt to the traditions of our lineage. Um, and this is kind of that old know your roots thing. And I've, I've noticed that the Catholic church likes to go around and, um, disconnect people from their ancestral roots because it disempowers them and they become easy to control. They become sheep. They're submissive. They, they're, Jesus has got them, you know, as soon as Jesus gets them, they're not really doing much. Um, interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've often wondered if, if, you know, black people complain a lot and rightly so that they have been disenfranchised from their ancestral roots, but most of them, if they really wanted to, could go to Africa to, you know, if they can trace their, I don't know, actually, if you've been taken as a slave, maybe, you know, you're going to have a hard time figuring out where you're from, but not anymore, right? We have the DNA thing, the testing. Um, so, you know, you can find out what your ancestral roots are. And in a lot of cases, the tribes are still there in Africa and they still know something of the plants and the traditions. A lot of them totally still know. Um, white people actually have been totally dis... I, I think... I think I think I'm back. Just give me a second to reformat my joint here. All right, so this looks, well, I might as well since, yeah, since I can't, hold on, let's get, what's that? Grab that. Oh, and then let me reboot the webcam and then, wait, it is rebooted, all right. <laughs> All right, guys, I think I think we're back in business. Um, I'm not sure where I lost you, though. Let me check in with the chat and see. Man, it's cool that some of you guys actually waited it out. This channel's actually been dying over the last couple of weeks, I think, because I was, um, you know, not really doing it much or something while I was traveling and breaking up with my partner and all that stuff. I'm not frozen. Why are you lying to me? Oh, this is the same. Hold on. Just a second, ladies and gentlemen. I never claim to be a professional. Man, I am butthurt about my mic, dude. That is for sure. That sucks, man. That I never lose gear. Like I've I've been traveling around with this stuff for how long now? Like are you fucking serious? Man. So the goal of tonight's stream is to make two hundred and fifty dollars so that we can get another um another one of those mics. And a new stand, I guess, because the part of it's missing. Why is this still frozen though? I don't understand. Let me just try this, maybe that'll do it. One of those mics. And then you stand, I guess. Oh, this is the wrong. That's what's going on. All right, I got it, guys. I got it. We have to go back to this video here. And then I don't know where I stopped. I know I was saying that, that white people don't know what their lineages are. Um, at all, really, unless you awaken it with Ibogaine or something. You want to work with a shaman, that's how I feel. But um, it's a you Let's see if I can find our spot. And I've seen that. I worked. Oh, wait a minute. I know how to do it. Go here now. It's because the part of it's missing. Oh, you can't see. Why is this still frozen, though? I don't understand. You can't see the minute marker. So I've been looking at this since there was no ayahuasca industry, which has revealed a lot in terms. 
Why didn't you guys tell me that it's not, the screen size isn't correct? What the hell, man? Why is that the case? Whatever. I, I don't know what the hell is going on. But we do want to pick this up in the next For time. nine years. Oh, before this guy, right? Very interested in... And et cetera. And, um... Believe it or not. So those sort of distortions. Um, but I'm aware that I got very lucky right. that I feel like I found an avenue into um, ayahuasca that had not acquire your autotom by drinking tobacco at eight years old by the waterfall for four days. You are not going to drink Datura when you're 13. You're not going to do that. You can't do that. You're well past that point. So we have to have um, our own processes. And so the syncretism uh, is derived from study and determination and objectivity, willingness to look past narratives and um, to confront possibly uncomfortable truths. But I think what I can offer that could be helpful is that we have to look at um, substitutes and we have to scale them to what is appropriate for people from Western culture. And that is the answer, I think, that a lot of the mystery traditions provide. The mystery traditions really are a um, sort of repository of techniques of esotericism from all over the world that have been collected under a sort of generic banner. And I think that for my part, encouraging people to look there for the resources that we need to make a proper integration with these absolutely essential and integral medicines, um, that's probably our best bet. And it's an awfully uh, interesting coincidence to me that at least three of us are heavily immersed in that kind of um, point of view. In fact, for those of you that don't know this, Freemasons are still buried to this day with a leaf from the acacia tree, 33rd degree Freemasons that contains DMT as a gateway to the spirit world. And so it's very likely that the kaikion that was consumed by Plato and other ancient Greeks, I mean, how do you think they figured out what an atom was, an indivisible unit of matter? They saw it because they drank a plant containing DMT in the Eleusinian Mysteries in the inner circle of the Apoptia was a group of individuals that had had this plant and they were considered the basically the shamans and the leaders um, in the, exactly the same way as the Schwader, which was really strange. They're also very secretive about their practices and the, the parallels were enormous and tremendous. And that is something I should also mention that we can look for um, practices and ideas, archetypes that are ubiquitous. So if you are going to have an ayahuasca cer ceremony, you are creating a circle. If you are in the Western mystery temple, you're creating a circle. If you are a druid, you're creating a circle. If you are Wiccan, you're creating a circle. And that circle defines the energies that are in your universe and repels those forces which are not supposed to be. There's almost always an acknowledgement of the four directions. So that's another tool in our bag is the ability to find these commonalities and integrate them into new systems. It's certainly true that shamanism um, and the mystery tradition, another thing I have in common, is that their objective is for the individual to realize their sovereignty and um, innovation. My teacher, uh, the Schwar teacher, would tell me not to watch the hands of my master, not to imitate his songs, to find my own songs, to learn the basic techniques, but to do them in my own way. And, so and that <clears throat> is another crux of the apostrophe. Let me, let me check in and make sure that everything is still going all right, because we were wonky for a minute there. Are you guys really that far behind? What is going on? We're good, right? I, th I think we're good. Um, sorry, you guys. South American internet service is not always um, the best. So... What was I saying though? Okay, so the autonomy and the sovereignty of the individual will. This is the shit. This is the crux of the apostrophe. This is the bullet point of the presentation. This is the whole kit and caboodle. This is the it and the oodle. Um, 
This is the spit in your boodle. <laughs> Um, you know, it's about discovering the individual true will and aligning yourself with it. In my case, I was very lucky in a sense that I was always constrained to that will as a, before I was born. I already, I knew what I couldn't stop thinking about because I couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> you know, I, I had my orientation when I came out of the Wagaina, um, and <clears throat> nothing has changed, you know, and, and it's actually bizarre to me now to think back and realize that, you know, I've pretty much been thinking like I do now when I was five. There's, there hasn't really been, you know, I'm more jaded probably, but, <laughs> but um, basically it's still ontologically, um, you know, congruent with my five-year-old self. Um, but the point is that, you know, these tools are supposed to be uh, for engineering your fierce individuality. It is not about conformity, you know? Why is everyone wearing fucking earth tone cotton clothes? Why do we all have ayahuasca plugs? Why do we all have Merkabuzz tattooed on our arm? You know how many symbols there are in the world? Go get your own symbols. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, why are we all singing fucking, you know, Pacha Mama, Pacha Mama, the same goddamn song at every ceremony? You know, what is going on, people? Stop with the primate imitation. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's monkey instinct. And, and so in the Kabbalistic system of like the four worlds of the soul, right, it's, it's a reflection, it's microcosm, macrocosm, right? You have um, the animal level, which is the lowest, and that's where we get this tendency to put a president on a pedestal. And, My president, and he's going to fix everything and all this bullshit, you know? That's one of the main things they prey on to keep you in the system, right, is your primate psychology. You have to stop imitating the other monkeys and stop looking to the alpha male. In order to um, redintegrate yourself to your former divine state, right? Redintegrate means to restore something to its former state. I thought it was a typo the first time I saw it. I thought it meant reintegrate, but redintegrate is actually a different thing, sort of, a little bit. Um, useful word, though, uh, in my line of work. At any rate, redintegrate yourself to your former divine state. You have to dis discover your absolute individuality. And um, that is another reason why we are not interested in the inculcation of religious figures as figureheads in the impulse of the Gnosis, like Jesus or Allah or whatever. There is no dogma to follow. There is no, you know, you are an individual <laughs> You know, you're, and I feel like what people do, you know, they get, they get out of the mainstream matrix and then they, they find another demographic and they try to be exactly like whatever they think that's supposed to be. Stop it. Stop it. You're ruining everything. You know what I mean? Like it, that's why I can't, one of the reasons I was so comfortable, uncomfortable at this thing, you know, because these guys that I'm sitting with were an exception to that. Um, and there were p people around that were also, but definitely some of those carbon clone plant medicine people, they were all hanging around outside and the, you know, the dining room was full of them and there were a few of them in there. And, you know, it's just that homogenization of people. Um, that's the opposite of the objective. And, you know, I did not adopt the Schwarz beliefs I, I do not believe necessarily in their waterfall spirits. I'm not obligated to. It drove him nuts, you know? It's like, just pretend. <laughs> just pretend that you believe for tonight, you know? <laughs> no, dude, no, I'm not gonna. I can't, it's not, I can't. Like, if I have some objective reason to believe in it, then I'll do it. I got no problem with that, but I don't, you know? I don't know what's going on here. And you admitted to yourself that you don't either. You know, he did. He's, he's I don't really know. Um, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about becoming a copy of an imitation of a copy of an imitation. Um, and I've, I've, I've heard people arguing about how you're supposed to learn Ikaros exactly like every inflection. Bullshit. Bullshit, man. Every single time a real Ikaro is different. The same Ikaro, like it has the same parts and pieces in the same way that a, a, a and I'm talking specifically about the Shipibo in this case. Um, but, you know, and, and, and by the way, Ikaro is not a Shipibo word. It's Quechua. This, this Ikaro is not what Shipibo call them. <laughs> Anyways, um, 
they, they have begun though, because you know why? Because you, the consumer, expect to hear them say that. Um, spindle twice. Uh, <laughs> what, what was I saying? Every single time they're performed differently, you know, because of the energy in the room, it's just like the Grateful Dead. You know, they played the song, same song differently every single time. And they were doing the same kind of shamanic work with energy and consciousness and music, exactly the same as the Shipibo. And they never played any song the same way twice in 30 years because that's not how you work this kind of magic, you know? I mean, if you think about it, it's once again microcosm, macrocosm. It's the, um, it's the same fucking day, man. You know, like Janis Joplin said, it's the same fucking day, man. Sun goes up, sun goes down, different shit happens in the interim. Different song, different day, still a song with different, you know, melody. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing, you know. Um, and you as an individual are a microcosmic expression of that. And so... Therefore, you need to be your own unique individual thing. Um, and so, you know, that's my opposition to Christianity is largely due to the fact that it is a homogen tool of homogenization. And the ayahuasca industry is as well. Because people have come up with this, like, idea that there's, like, this right way to do it. There's a standard protocol. And I've literally watched um, people accuse, uh, you know, become suspicious of completely traditional shaman because they're traditional and they have, you know, been in this industry, you know, around all these phony ass plant medicine people that have them convinced that there's like all these certain ways that things are supposed to be that it's got, it's not, it's not, they've created this shit. They wrote their own script to give themselves credibility and everyone swallowed it. You know, it's just like I, I was talking to this this amazing woman last night and um, and another woman a couple days earlier at this same event. Um, and both of them were so deeply traumatized by the idea of adrenochrome being harvested from babies that when they thought about it, they were like visibly like it's not fucking real. It never was real. Adrenochrome is a stress hormone, basically. If you took it, you would shake all over. You would sweat. You would be, it's horrific. You would never want to take it. And if you did, not only would it not preserve your youth, it would make you age rapidly. It's the stupidest fucking conspiracy theory outside of flat earth. It really is. You Not only is there only micrograms of it, even if you terrified a baby, and then took the, the drain, there's micrograms. It's a milliliter dose. Do you guys know how many fucking babies you would need to get a single dose? Trash trucks full. It's stupid. It's incredibly fucking stupid. And this is why scientific Illuminism, you know, we study shit. We learn things. And that way we are light. And when falsehood crosses our path, it gets fucking incinerated. You know? It's it's not hard, you guys. It's not fucking hard. These women are damaged by this shit, and it's just an urban legend that came from a movie with Johnny Depp called Fear and Loathing in fucking Las Vegas <laughs> based on a Hunter S. Thompson book. Hunter S. Thompson was not a fucking insider at the time. He was like an editor at Playboy or something. He was not, he was like, he was not famous when he wrote that book. It's stupid. It's completely fucking stupid. And you can order liters of it from China for like 20 bucks. Yep. Not to mention, have you noticed all these adrenochrome drinkers like Bill Clinton stuff getting old as fuck? I mean, it, you know, it just, it's, it, and you could say, oh, well, that you're saying it does make you age rapidly, so he does drink it. No, stupid. Stop it. Just because a bunch of people say a bunch of stupid shit doesn't make it real. You know what I mean? What was that? There was like a Blink-182 song or something where they're like, you say that like 500,000 screaming fans can't be wrong and I say 500,000 screaming fans are fucking idiots. That guy was smart. That guy was smart. If you find yourself agreeing with the um, majority, fucking load up the buckshot and no i'm just kidding i mean you should reassess your uh position mark twain said that same 
same shit, different day, man. <laughs> you know, nothing has changed since the days of Mark Twain. If you find yourself like believing something that a whole shit ton of people believe just because they believe it, you might be an idiot. You know what I mean? So don't be an idiot. Don't be an idiot. I'm just, I'm so tired of it. I'm sorry. I know I'm kind of ranting and cussing a lot and like, like sarcastic and fuming, but I'm just so tired of it. I'm tired of flat earth. I'm tired of adrenochrome. I'm tired of people ruining ayahuasca. <laughs> you know, I'm tired of phony spiritual people, um, you know, getting uh, accolades and, you know, I mean, I'm just, I'm tired of it, man. And, and it's not, it's not hard. This is, this is not rocket science, you know. Um, it's actually not that difficult to sift through. And here, 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 dude, I'm about to dump some shit on you. Watch this. It's not hard. It's not hard. The reason that we are in this predicament boils down to a question. What is the most fundamental human characteristic? Fear or laziness? In other news... So one of the negative side effects, I think, of the ayahuasca industry is that people have become very imitative. imitative. There is a sort of um, misconception that shamanism is some standardized protocol that everyone does the same way and people I've actually watched outsiders come and be suspicious of shaman that are totally traditional because they're traditional and they have read on the internet that things are supposed to be some other way so um, that's probably all I have to say about that so thank you guys very much. I have a question about the Freemasons. Uh, I've always been unsure of what they're about, but I've said some things that have been infiltrated in that space. Um, there's a friend of mine who's very deeply into it, and I've seen them, they are kind of interested in them. And I just wanted to know more about who they are and where they're at now, because you get a feeling that you're very aware of what they are, like the way about them. There are many, so many different books and stuff, and things online about where they came from, and like where they've been hiding and stuff, and some of them do some good things, but I do feel they're very infiltrated, but I just want to give some more clarity on that. This is another reason why we have um, some um, resentment towards Christianity, I guess. The reason that the mysteries became identified with Satanism and the Illuminati were perceived as evil and all that stuff is because it was a book published in 1933 called Secret Societies published by a fundamentalist Christian who basically saw that Bishop was saying we need to get rid of religion, we need to get rid of borders. And of course, right-wing Christians in the United States are very nationalistic and they're also very religious. So they saw this and they went, holy crap, that's Satan. That's absolutely untrue. The idea was that rational illuminism, illumination, could be taught, that it could become a cultural standard and disseminated throughout the world. And so if there are no borders, who are you going to fight? And without religion, everyone has direct access to divine knowledge in their own course of gnosis. And so the entire demonization of the Illuminati and Freemasonry and all that is actually um, Orwellian propaganda, in my opinion, to, dis to discourage people from finding the most powerful tool that they have access to. And if you actually look up the Vaishyap papers online, when they raided his house, they actually seized his private papers, and these were not publications, so there's no reason it would be propaganda. And it blows my mind how many conspiracy theories don't even, or theorists don't know that they exist because you would think you would go to the horse's mouth and go read the Weissalt papers. And Weissalt? The, 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 the founder Weisalt. of the Illuminati. The Bavarian Illuminati. And, and then really this, this uh, Illuminati tradition goes back to Pythagoras and before that to um, Babylonian Syria. Um, so it didn't start with Weissalt or Weishaupt. I don't know how to actually pronounce it. But. Um, it's just basically the idea is that you use the same kind of um, protocol to navigate spirituality and metaphysics that you would to the real world because they're reflections of each other. And so um, it's not really a dogma or a doctrine. There, there's no belief system. There are no gods. It's just a way of interpreting metaphor and allegory and geometry and... Did you see the way? Did you see the way Andrew reacted when I said there were no gods? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh.
Oh man, that's just hilarious. Yeah, he's very disgruntled at that idea that the mysteries don't revolve around Jesus. The energy and the psychology and um, yeah, I mean. It's... So the ones without borders, who were trying to get rid of the borders, was it the religious people? Or was it... Why so? They they wanted to get rid of all 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 nations and all religions. And people think, well, doesn't that sound like centralized power that's going to rule the world? That's a big problem. But what they don't understand is we're talking about disseminating a form of higher consciousness first so that what it means to have government is redefined before that happens. So it's not really about the consolidation of power over one. So zero power that's governed by something from the Exactly, source. yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that leaves me... <clears throat> wow. It's For some reason, there's nothing more disconcerting than a bored Latina. <laughs> it strikes fear into my heart for some reason. And, um, it's quite amazing listening to all the different people and being here and hearing everybody's different takes on medicine and how it works. And um, my name is Sean West. I've been uh, Mm, working with medicines since mm, the early 90s um, and I've definitely come into medicines in a very not traditional way I definitely was one of these people that was very suspicious of if it's old has it been has it been adapted to now and I've always and basically I'm a, I'm a trauma release therapist. My main work is body work. That's trauma release body work. And, um, and I kind of reflected that right into the medicine. And for me, the medicine, um, all the medicines I work with, um, Wachuma, Ayahuasca, especially those, and then also body work, meditation. Um, they're about going in you now. And I, I always felt and uh, worked with the medicine in a, in a way that it's for illuminating into a person. There's not, it's not that important visions and celestial realms and things like this. It's more important that the person comes into contact with their trauma from their life and even in a um, work with the collective trauma. And, um, and the idea of trauma being, and what medicine can do is that it, allows us to feel that trauma and be in that trauma which is all the trauma wants and it helps it to to be realized honored loved respected trauma then resolves into wisdom inside of ourselves and i see especially ayahuasca i i do very focused one-on-one -on -one ceremonies or very very small groups and um I feel like the deeper it goes, the more it helps everybody. So like just one person doing something very deep with the medicine and coming into contact with ancestral trauma, with their trauma, can help everybody. And Now, this guy has a very understated kind of, in a way, <clears throat> he was my favorite speaker. And it's funny because when he was talking, because of the way he was speaking... I didn't like, I didn't connect with it at all. I thought, you know, in the moment, <laughs> I wasn't really with it. Um, but then when I watched it on the replay, I was like, wow, actually, this guy's, he just, he has a certain mannerism and a certain delivery um, that you have to kind of be patient with. But he actually has some very wise things to offer, but nothing as profound as the fact that I am going to share with you right now. Figs have an incredibly long shelf life in the refrigerator. <laughs> They've been in there since the day I moved in, and they're still perfect. <laughs> I've definitely very influenced by Shipibo tradition. I like the way Shipibo use sound, Ikaro. Um, very eclectic though. I'm, I'm also very into Dharma. I like Dharma. <coughs> it makes sense. Um, 
I tend to be very eclectic. You know, I, I, I like to draw from all different tra traditions what seems to make sense and what has, what brings with it um, the concepts of loving yourself, feeling your heart, and um, connection with other humans, like finding connection with others is a very important aspect, especially working with medicines. And I found, you know, I question even the idea of maestro in a ceremony. Like, I'm very accessible during a ceremony. Like, people can talk. They, they can ask for light. It's, it's, it's about creating a comfortable zone where people can feel like they can really dive deeper. And for me, the, the real true work is this working with this collective trauma that humanity is carrying in it, all of us. And, um, and I think um, this is the work of the medicine. And relying on old traditions to guide us isn't always going to work because we're now, this is now, and it's a very powerful now. We're at a turning point in the, the history of humans. We're all very connected and very um, aware, and there's a deeper awareness even just a common human is even more aware of the plight of other humans, and, and, and like the ideas are like this, that we are starting to even, like I was born in 64, and through the 70s, if you even mentioned the word trauma, you know, they, they said, like, what's wrong with you? You're, like, weird, you know? And, like, this whole concept is now, like, you'll hear a redneck from Oklahoma say, yeah, I got trauma, you know? And it's like, the, so things have really shifted. And, and I think, like, it's really important, these medicines being available, they're okay. It's, you know, I often, people come to me and ask for medicine. I ask, okay. why do you want to take medicine, you know? How are you doing, you know? And like, what do you? What's your intention with this? Why, why do you want to take medicine? And and I think those are good questions. And and as much preparation as people will do, I'm totally into that. Like, don't smoke pot. Don't you know? Have a clean diet. Let's get you onto the into the ceremony as clean as possible. So it's medicine. I'm curious too because Santa Santa Daime <clears throat> smokes pot at the end of every ceremony, and I wonder if they do. Um, there is a Santa Daimi nearby, and I am a little bit curious. Again, I am totally opposed to the idea of ayahuasca churches, except in the United States where they have to do it for legal reasons. I'm talking about actually making religion around it. Um, but, uh, it, you know, I, I was not aware until this. I had to. Ch I thought he was making it up when he was like, it's a hermetic ayahuasca church. Like, what the fuck, man? No way. And, and I looked it up, and I couldn't find anything, <laughs> except for Daniel Pinchbeck saying that um, it had some things in common with hermeticism. And so I'm not convinced, really. And I'm considering showing up at Sunday service and uh, kind of investigating this for myself firsthand. I probably should continue to try to probe into these things. Although, uh, in a way, I just don't care. <laughs> you know, I don't really want to know what the ayahuasca church is doing any more than I already do. Um, you know, um, they're making a religion out of ayahuasca. It's not good. <laughs> it's kind of the long and short of it. But, um, yeah, maybe I'll go and check it out and see. Maybe I'll be swayed and I'll come back with a bell and a stick and my hair is all gone. Can, can work really deep with you. And, um, and I found that, you know, like I like all these, everything I'm hearing is, is sounding really great. And, and I, I think that one of the things, commonalities that I'm seeing, like for, for actually good ceremonial work, is connection and um, compassion. And these things are more, more important than even the music that is played or the, the ceremony that's, you know, made. It's, it's good to call in the directions. I call in the directions. I call in benevolent energies with a lot of gratitude. I don't ask for protection. I always feel that things 
come that need to be worked with in the space and, and everything's welcome and I and that's like one of the aspects of like medicine that I think is very coming to be and being a, a modern aspect of medicine is the idea that non-adversarial healing is the way to go creating an adversary creating an entity, creating something that needs to be extracted or something that's coming from outside of you to attack you or any of these things is useless. It's not, it's not working. I've been watching it for 30 years, it's not working. You know, and so like the idea of integrating becomes much deeper from that standpoint. Like we integrate our dark side, we integrate every aspect of ourself, we accept love, honor, respect all these things and through that we really shift the perspective on things and we and we finally really work with the fear and the idea that that fear is a thing to be going going into and something to be resolved through going into it and facing it you know these kind of concepts are, are new in a lot of ways I mean I like find the Shipibo maestro that I most resonate with, he's really different than the other Shipibos. Like, there's, a, there, there's so much variation in tradition. And, um, I mean, I like his concepts about, I'm just vibrating things with my Ikaro and getting things to loosen up so that you can get flow and connection. Voila. Nothing more. It's not about anything deeper than that. It's, it's a... And I do, uh, I do like to follow this tradition of the Shipibo. I like very much using Icaros and sound, as well as like, the Daimistas also work with sound and, and, and vibration and, and this concept. And uh, in this community, you know, it's the beauty, beautiful thing, the nature of the Daimistas is that they have this community and this connection. And, and Andrew knows all of his people and like he knows them by name. And it's a very beautiful, this is for me, you know, important, and this is like, um, you know, that he's bringing this into the now is important. And the idea of initiation, you know, it's, it's you know, people are coming, I have a tendency to be like, you know, come as you are, you know, you will work with that. And, and um, so, I, you know, I think it's, it's great to have all different possibilities with the medicine. People become attracted to what they want to work with, mostly. And, uh, and the connection that they have with that person that they're going to work with, I think, is the, actually the most important thing. And this dude, like, I'm, I'm down for, you know, his whole vibe. <clears throat> um, the only thing is, you know, it's like the initiation thing. I don't know about that come as you are. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I get it, you know. But I, I think that's only appropriate for certain contexts and certain types of intentions. And... Luckily, I think generally the way that the universe works is that things are kind of like chemicals in a petri dish. So, the people that are appropriate for his um, um, kind of laid-back, laissez-faire kind of vibe, um, um, it, it probably will gravitate to him. Um, with my background, it's no surprise that I ended up working with the Schwar. You know, um, <laughs> it's. Uh, you know, but the, the 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 reality is that there's chaos in the universe, and um, yeah, I mean, I I really don't know what to think. I I, I can't say that he's wrong, um, but I think that you know, even for myself, really, I if I had known what magic was before I got involved with it, <laughs> you know. And I had had a, a better understanding of the dynamics of ayahuasca and stuff. I would have done way more preparation before I went and fucked around and found out, you know. Um, because, for example, I, I I I discovered that I had a very powerful will and ability to sort of manifest things on a level that was um, frightening, even. And um, <clears throat> the problem with that is that I, I hadn't resolved my traumas. I hadn't um, developed self-worth to the extent that I needed to. I knew what I was capable of, but I didn't have any real self-esteem in a way. So it was like a really bad combination of like recognition of like this like monstrous potential 
but then also this complete and total skepticism and lack of faith. And, you know, it was a bad combination. And even worse is um, too much enthusiasm without wisdom because then you really just fucking, like gunpowder lost in the void, you know, there's nothing funneling it anywhere. And, um, you know, I found myself wielding a tremendous amount of power and I just destroyed everything in my wake with it really, you know, in the long run. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, you know, I, I, part of me is, you know, kind of down with this dude's like, you know, it's all good kind of, <laughs> but, um, again, it's, it's really a matter of context. Um, and, um, uh, so I really, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's evolving medicine. It's not a set deal at all, you know, and even anybody who brings a dogma or a set concept into medicine, they're always going to be limited, you know, to, to how deep the, really that work is going to be because, you know, what I have found working with ayahuasca, for example, or even Wachuma, you know, is the idea that every person is unique and every situation is new every time is a completely new adventure you know if you're not questioning yourself <laughs> in the middle of giving a ceremony then you know then maybe you're a little bit overconfident you know there's always this question you know like is this and listening and, and, and connection to this person to work with them and i think that you know with modern um trauma therapy you know, people like Gabor and many people coming into like deeper understanding of what trauma is and um, how to work with it, you know, and, and there's a lot of books you can read, there's a lot of information out there, but finally it's experience and, and that's like I think one of the most important aspects when seeking or working with anybody with medicine is, is like look at, look at who's been working with it, you know, and, and who, who um, you know, has experience and experience with working with trauma, you know, and having trauma come up in a space and the idea of just being really open to that also, that trauma is okay, you know, it's like, yes, that's what our work is. I mean, I call my work trauma release, like I work with a very strong ayahuasca, a red ayahuasca that's really different every time you take it. It's, it's, it's such a, a beast. and but, the idea and the intention is always to go for that collective, for that personal trauma to come. And that seems to be what seems to help, you know, it's like to bring the person into connection with the divine, with whatever their spiritual calling is. And creating this connectivity to that involves resolving the charge around trauma. And so I'm a very big trauma, like trauma is where we go and what we work on. Um, I'm kind of meandering around. Um, Why did he just turn into Donald Trump for a second? Did you guys catch that? Wow, that was amazing. Look, I'm laughing. I'm laughing then because I, I noticed it. I was like, whoa, man. Maybe demons are real. He just got possessed by Donald Trump. <laughs> but, um, so I, I feel like, you know, the, it's evolving. It's getting better. PSAC now. I've been here 14 years. It's so much more grounded now than it was 14 years ago. The medicine work, people are becoming more discerning. They're starting to say, okay, this guy says he's going to heal me. All right, red flag. I'm not going to work with that. That's not, yeah. You know, the idea that, you know, all medicine, all work is about any kind of work with medicine involves changing your lifestyle, changing the way you behave, what you think, controlling your mental content. You know, working with these things in your day-to-day -day life are much more important than taking a lot of medicine. And, uh, you know, coming into contact with people that are encouraging you to heal yourself also is a very important aspect, you know? It's like, you're going to heal you. Nobody's going to heal you. The medicine is not going to heal you. And we can see the medicine is definitely... a it's got intelligence, it's, it's alive, but it's not ethical. It does not judge who is serving it. And like I 
it's wild to hear how honest this this panel was compared to normal, you know, because what you usually hear is like it's all light and you know we're all just like sitting around blowing lines of fairy dust and huffing unicorn farts and it's all vegan fucking bliss. <laughs> What what is this crap, you know? And and <laughs> ayahuasca, you know, the whole Pachamama just all loving everything and you know, people make up shit like, you know, if you, you try to use it for evil, bad things will happen to you. No way, dude. There are brujas that have been brujas for seventy fucking years, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just like it was just really refreshing to hear all of this like honest reality coming from all these people here because I'm not used to that. I don't. Yeah, I, I have trouble finding it. Even you know, I've watched people without ethic work with medicines forever until they die. You know, it's like that. She just like loves all the little creatures. You know, dark and nasty and light and big and small. You know, she's like the Pachamama. You know, she she loves everything and and so definitely. Like the ethics of the ex. I don't think Andrew liked that either, but you know, it's because he's got a lot of dogma. I think you know, he's he's like he thinks he has things figured out, and you know, Jesus is the light in the way, and the medicine is good, and probably vegan. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I noticed he shot both both of us like pretty dirty looks a couple times. Like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> Actual ethics of the person working with the medicine are actually one of the biggest players in all of this and I think that you know a piece of advice when you work with you seek to work with medicine you know it's like ask yourself why am I seeking to work with medicine is there some what is this that I wish to resolve and also we have a really good look at who you're gonna take medicine with because that's really important like like the old psychonauts you know like Leary and and etc. Then, you know, the idea of like who and where and what kind of space are you are you taking these medicines in? These are important aspects and, and, and knowing and having a connection, a human connection to to whoever you're going to work with medicine with, you know, it's like I feel like Definitely one of the limitations of some of the indigenous traditions is the idea the maestro is there. He's kind of unapproachable. It's difficult to communicate during the ceremony with certain people giving ceremonies. And this is completely like, this is not for me like modern, like this is what we have to offer as a modern shamanic or facilitator tradition is the idea of accessibility to the person and, and, and feeling of human connection. You know? Connection is the biggest container, you know, it's like that contains space. Compassion also, this, this um, real compassion from the person serving, the compassion of the people in the space for each other and the connection, you know, everybody that sits in a medicine space should know each other's names. They should know what they're working with. Like, that's why, like, it's difficult for me to even do large groups because the retreats want it to happen in this kind of space and, like, this time period. And, like, for me, it's so important that the, all these people that are going to sit together, they just got to talk to each other for hours and get to know each other and know what what's coming into the space to do work and I keep it simple by working one-on-one -on -one, you know in small groups this this is I find a much easier way to work with medicines but um, I think uh, I'm really excited to meet Harley and Yannette and, and here Andrew and and I, I and I think that all the things that they're describing and talking about definitely these are ways in you know these are ways to approach and be in the medicine i tend to be very simple keep it simple silly and uh kiss and um but i also recognize the necessity for some people to have like deeper conscious structures to work with and that's that's all good too and i think you know but finally what, what guides it all is just like what's happening from intention, heart, and connection. I, think that's, I can't think of Thank anything you. else so to say. We'll open it up because we're running a bit behind. So, um, 
I think if you speak from back there, we may not catch it on the mic. Oh, no, it will. It will? Okay. Yeah. It's tough. Maybe I have, I have two questions. Um, the first one is one, why do you think that in the shamanic practices and traditions it evolved like there is no direct personal compassionate connection in ceremonies between the participant and the shaman? Oh, that's really interesting. So, if we, if we look at shamanic tradition, small villages, a shamanic a shaman, uh, addressing a, a certain problem, it's kind of like a doctor. You know, there's like a kind of removed, kind of analytical, analyze the problem and fix the problem. You know? and, uh, and this is kind of like a, what is it called? Um, it's old. It's a, it's a concept, it, it fit into its context thousands of years ago. Uh, the kind of people that were like working with that and also the power of suggestion and like but now people are not so much like that they're much more open and informed you know and so I think like um, now especially you know like we we're coming to realize that yes our culture is all culture on this planet human culture is traumatized like it's been a rough 10,000 years it hasn't been going well and you know maybe I feel like we're coming out of that but I think also that, that there's been a, a, a development in the in the concept that you know Jungian even like Jung really brought this bringing into the concept that yeah you got to be friends with this person that you're going to work with to help them heal it's it's about connection you no know? more connection you no know? and not so much there's an evil spirit after you so we're going to do this and psh, fix it and like you're okay now so it's more like a therapeutic relationship yeah yes definitely i'm very that's a great way of putting it i would have said that it's the ayahuasca industry honestly because that's not really my experience when it was my first teacher we had very small groups at first it was very intimate he would go and often he would come back and say i have been consulting with spirit about your mother and we would talk for 45 minutes but then as his groups got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger even though he wasn't advertising just word of mouth we lost that connection mm. so i eventually stopped going and started working with his teacher because it wasn't, you know, that wasn't happening. But I think that a lot of that has to do, the depersonalization has to do with the industrialization. That is one of the issues I didn't even mention. It's like definitely, like for me, I find my work with the ayahuasca, thera therapeutic work, uh, is really enhanced by the fact that I don't depend on that money. People pay me for my time, and I kind of extrapolate like what kind of like, like I lose the whole next day, so I can't do body work that whole day. So how much do I charge? And so I charge this, and I charge to help pay for the medicine. But I'm not trying to like support a lifestyle or anything with the medicine work. And I find that really loosens things up, and I see that with the daimi work also. It's not about the money. And that is an issue, you know. We get professional ayahuasqueros, even shipibos, very interested in the money. And like, I've worked with the shipibos, uh, helping them put together ceremonies and stuff, and it's kind of startling how into the money they are. And, and I, I, I see, you know, that definitely creates an in-person, it's like the salesperson, the, the vendor relationship that's like not so clear. And that's definitely one of the big aspects of the whole ayahuasca industry. You know, there's a lot of money being made by doing big ceremonies, for example. So I understand that before what, 200 years, it was not like that. It was a personal connection. It was more like what she was talking about. Well, it's like they would just the first. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's a, I mean, it's the shaman like would take the medicine, and the person would sit there and be healed. You know. Also, we have to think our context. We are coming as foreigners to the shaman. So first, there is a cultural barrier, there is a language barrier, there is also this idea that the shaman, like reading Don Juan, the shaman is the teacher. So um, there is this barrier. The shaman in their community is the uncle, is the fisherman, is the friend. It is a different uh, context. 
So, so we have to also take in account this, uh, who we are, so who we are for the indigenous person. Mm -hmm. So it also correlates for me to, to relate to the, the fact that you said that the diet is two years, maybe, and in these two years I assume you live within the community and create this personal relationship. Even more importantly, if you consider the traditional role of a shaman, like, like they were both saying that the shaman drank the medicine and worked on the patient. And all the years that I've been involved with ayahuasca, I have seen one person that still works that way. And so, um, aside from that, in a, even if you have like the shuar, for example, it's not really like everyone drinks together, but everyone has drank. There are the, the girls drink for autotune to, to a certain kind. And, but anyways, you know, the kofan, for example, have collective ceremonies. But the shaman has known every single person since they were born. He knows all their traumas, yeah. he knows their parents' traumas, he knows everything about him. He has a deep, profound, intimate relationship. And we have this idea in the commercial industry that you're supposed to stay cocooned up and like not let people in your energy space and then you're going to get together with 150 strangers and drink. <laughs> they could be you know, the worst imaginable kind of people carrying, you know, whatever. And so this makes sense somehow that we're doing this. It's, it's, just, it's absolutely not okay. The yeah. whole idea, and, and people will say, well, you can have a shaman that can, no. They'll have like one shaman, and if he was really or she was really absorbing all of the crap from 150, even 300 people I've heard of, die. they would die. They would just drop dead on the spot. There's no way that there's six facilitators who don't know anything about shamanism and one shaman are cleansing the space for 150 people. It's not happening. And I've seen that. I worked for nine years in a ceremonial space here that would have a hundred people in the space taking a very strong ayahuasca and it was a psycho circus and then we wonder why there are all these ego inflations and you know like just people going nuts in the weeks and months after the retreats and mm. it has a lot to do with the fact that they're being exposed to all sorts of stuff so. and it's super important like if somebody is going to be going to a ceremony that the person is facilitating the ceremony come to you and has a screening process because the person in that is the work that I have been doing for many years. It's like we want to know if this person is, if the medicine is going to be good for them. Because the medicine is not for everybody. Mm -hmm. There will be so many people that even they are curious, they have a call, but uh, their mental stability, their um, physical state, their intentions are not aligned and it could be even worse. Oh, yeah. So for the people that are going to be drinking medicine, there has to be a screening process. There has to be an interest from the person that is serving you medicine to just don't serve you like that. This is one of the reasons that, like, I, you know, when I do events, I, I generally only um, advertise within my community because then I know that we have people like this, basically, you know, more or less people of the same, you know, you're not going to come all the way to South America to see me unless you're relating to me pretty profoundly. And so there's a really good chance that we have some kind of central connection between all of the people. And, you know, so far that really um, worked well for the, for the groups. Um, I think everybody really, <clears throat> you know, appreciated having that kind of foundation. And speaking of that, uh, I am still considering putting an um, a event together here. Obviously, I've got the people um, I have a, basically an idea of who we would be working with and where we would be doing it, but um, I can't do anything definitively unless I, all, all it takes is one deposit and then it's on. So um, if anyone is interested in coming here for any amount of time, email me at junglenosis.com or whatever. You can find all kinds of ways to get a hold of me. And, um, you know, from where I'm at right now, there are ruins around that we have basically um, open access to. They're not restricted. Um, and so, you know, don't go climbing around in them and stuff. But you can go up there, you know, and, and we can drink medicine there. And and uh, there's some really good washumeros here. I don't really know uh, what, how I feel about, you know, ayahuasca and PSOC. It doesn't really... I would prefer to kind of take the... Um, was it called when you only eat the stuff around you? Macrobiotic diet, you know, microbiotic medicine. Uh, but I do understand that people, you know, are going to be interested in that. And that's actually my primary um, 
um, ally, I guess. So um, we will do that, I guess. I just I would I would prefer the focus to be on Andean medicines like Wilka and um, and uh, Wachuma, and I have a. Uh, well, it actually is something that certain tribes do, so it's it's not my proprietary thing, but uh, I do um, <clears throat> think it's uh, the best way to experience Wilka is uh, towards the tail end of San Pedro. Um, it just there's just something about the way that it it smooths out the body load and it sort of like clarifies the visions and it's it just really works um, really well. These two plant medicines together. Uh, and then of course, you know, it's an opportunity for people to, uh, I find that, you know, the interactive process, um, for teaching the state of mind of Illuminism, um, uh, and also from a therapeutic point of view, I mean, I, I, I definitely, um, have scored a lot of points with, with clients in that, in that, um, regard. And it never ceases to amaze me how complex we are as individuals and how deep we have to go and how much stuff there can be. Um, so I guess, you know, that kind of almost negates what I was saying earlier about drinking ayahuasca 300 times because of all the trauma. I mean, I guess it just depends on who you are. Um, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that you shouldn't just drink ayahuasca whenever you want. I mean, I, I don't agree. Like um, um, Janet said that... Uh, you know, more ceremonies aren't necessarily better. For some people, that may be true. But for me, most of the people that I've seen that have a lot of work to do, it's best to just keep them almost afloat for a month. Um, you know, four days out of seven. Uh, five days out of seven, even. Um, for, you know, four weeks, even. Um <clears throat> And it, it's it, what I was really saying, though, is that there's no reason that you can't do. I mean, I know people that one of my teachers, it, I, I think he has to have had 20,000 cups or more by now. It hasn't done him any harm. Um, and one of the extraordinary things about that is that his teeth, right, because you vomit like and he's absorbing the energy, the, all the bad stuff from his groups and you'll hear him go out and just vomit like I call it jaguar vomiting because it just sounds like it's horrific sounding um and sometimes he'll just make these like he'll just be sitting there in the circle and he'll just make these incredibly loud like it's not fake it's not a burp it's not vomit nothing comes out of him I don't know what it is he never explained it to me it's fucking crazy um, but I have a, it's got to have something to do with cleansing the space, I guess. Um, but the point is, his teeth are not affected, even though he's vomited, you know, thirty six thousand times in the last ten years or whatever. So it, it's just amazing. It, it, I, I assume that's because the ayahuasca alkalizes the stomach acids, so they don't destroy your teeth when it comes up. Um, the engineering, you know, in this stuff, like the evidence of a divine hand is pretty overwhelming, I'd have to say. So let's keep going with this. Mm -hmm. Because it's uh, out of uh, their own interest, out of my interest to don't have disabled people, out of your interest to have a, a person that cares for you, and out of the interest for these plants. Because mm. uh, what happens if... Uh, things go really bad, they become what people think about ayahuasca, it makes you crazy, this is a drug, this is that, and uh, it's very important to us as community that uh, work with this medicine, take care of the safety of the whole name of these traditions. Uh, this, as I think you were saying, these traditions uh, have a time for thousands of years. Like the first ayahuasca cup was like uh, found uh, 3,000, have a date of 3,000 years. So this is being passed over and over again for thousands of, for many generations. And is in, we are now the guardians of these medicines. Before it was indigenous person, the same tribe, perhaps like always moving and changing because culture is like that. So even though it was different tribes, there is also different ways of working with the medicine. But right now, 
we are the medicine holders, we are the medicine carriers, and I think like we all have the responsibility of uh, taking that wisdom mm, with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we can go ahead and wrap it up right there because I think uh, some dude in the audience is about to um, go on about the Rainbow Tribe for about 35 minutes. Although there was some other good question for um, Andrew, I think that... supposed to be, you know, a, a master. Uh, so I think this, you know, it's, it's part of this contemporary world. It's not... Uh now we have the situation where we have schools where you can just go and pay and then yeah, you have an right. we, we, we've, we've gone far enough I think we've made our point but I will remain online if you guys like and we can actually just start chatting and stuff because I'm not going to go to bed anytime soon so might as well what do you mean one concurrent viewers what is this what is this one concurrent view that number better be wrong man I'm not sitting here for three hours for one fucking person am I <laughs> oh my god it's true all right well there's 12 of you over here so let's see um let me get my uh screen back up and organized so that it's not so dumb looking and um we can have a chat about whatever you guys would like Hopefully my PayPal, Zelle, and all of my other options for supporting Illuminostic have been dinging, 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 and I've just missed the notifications. Otherwise, you guys are fired. Seriously, I have to get another condenser mic. I can't do interviews. I can't, can't do anything. And then the guitar, i got to repair the guitar. It's just too much, you guys. <sighs> what a world, what a world. And it's funny, yesterday, man, yesterday I had such a good day because, you know, I um, I <clears throat> I went up into the ruins and explored and it was amazing. And then I got to counsel um, one of my friends who's uh, one of my friend's mother. He, he, he recently committed suicide. And that was going on while I was editing the talk which I was realizing went really well. So I was like, all right, I got this talk I'm editing and I just found some green gems and bones and ruins and shit in the backyard. And, and, uh, and what else? Um, that's better. Uh, you know, and then, oh yeah, I got, I got, I managed to scare up a bit of a loan because my partner has lost her fucking mind and I had to bail her out of a situation that I told her was going to be bad. And, uh, with no small degree of satisfaction, the, um, replacement had turned psychotic on her within a matter of days and I had to find a way to bail them out. So, um... That was that was kind of, you know it was kind of a pain in the ass because I had to kind of swallow my pride a little bit but it was also kind of like told you so way to go man that's what happens karma just just bitch slapped you it only took a few days to <laughs> man anyways so you know things were going too well and so I was like oh and then I found my hat this morning when I woke up I thought I lost it because. I uh, searched the whole house and then I got in bed and pulled my comforter over and the hat fell on my face. <laughs> so everything was going so good. And then I set up the stream and I'm looking around for my, my, my XLR 770 and, and it's not here. And then I realized I had to have left it in a fucking van because I had to take several vans. And then the last one was about to pull away as they were, and it was the last one. So I think I, I put the microphone down, got money out of my pocket to pay the guy, and then just jumped out of the van and left. That's what happened. So, man. Yeah, I got a, I got another shirt. I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, yeah, like I, I, I have to adapt, you know. I, I'm I'm going out in public and stuff again. I'm not in the jungle anymore. It was weird to be at that talk because I've only been out of the jungle for, I don't know, how long, you guys? I mean, you're paying more attention probably than I am. 
to time anyways. I mean, I'm assuming you guys have jobs and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. How long have I been here? What is it, like the 28th? How can I figure out how long I've been here? I don't know what to do. <laughs> Illuminostic life, are you still here? There's only one person left in the shorts feed. Oh, wait, yeah, vertical. No, it's the same. It's not a vertical feed. That's why no one was in here. That's stupid. All right, anyways. A few weeks, yeah. It's probably been a few weeks. Damn it, I forgot to set it for vertical. Man, you stupid ass. I was really trying to get a bunch of views on this by streaming it in the vertical fucking thing, and I forgot to change the key. Where do we go for the panel? A place called Soul Seed Cafe. Um, they have good chicken tacos and organic coffee, and they have coca leaves on the bar that I think you can just eat. Um, they throw flowers at you and shit. <laughs> when you walk in, they have like like petals, petals in a bucket, and they'll throw handfuls of. Um, I read nothing. I don't know what the fuck that means. I'm a hot mess. We were all laughing. I don't understand that the chat is freaking me out right now. I don't know what the fuck you guys are talking about. <laughs> Alice Cooper band hat. I mean, this really this chat is just like a like a, a Salvador Dali painting or something with words. I don't know what any of you guys are talking about. Yeah, I recommend going to the event too, but I will call it Mountain Gnosis this time. The find, what the find cactern? Jungle noses. Man, yeah, you guys are just a loony bin in the chat tonight. I don't know what to make of that. 183 views, three hours and 17 minutes. I'm pissed off, though, that this other one is not vertical. Because that, I'm just going to, well, no, there's a couple people in there. You guys can stay. That's just so dumb. That's why it crashed earlier, too, because it has to be a vertical and a horizontal so anyways if you guys have questions for me um give me something to talk about you know i'm cal rifkin jr i can riff on stuff riffle stiltskins pippy riffle stockings <laughs> we caught the shit man pick his nose we caught the shirt man pick his nose my nose yeah you know what really like i'm not i'm squeezing it because it's like so dry in there from being in the jungle for two years and then now being in the um i mean there's like scabs honestly like it's just so dry here compared to the jungle that my internals are like just scabbing up if you have to know bro um <laughs> Fastest crab in Minnesota, you guys. Come on, give me some questions so I have something to talk about. Where did you guys go for the panel? You asked that in the other chat. It's so dumb that we have two horizontal thingies. Oh, the Christian dude. I <laughs> Look at him, he doesn't give a fuck, man. He's, he's, past, he's past his, his you know... He's past his rising prime. He's not, he's not a rizzolopagus rizzle, anymore. He's not a um, Terizosaurus Rex. <laughs> I'm a Terizosaurus Rex, though. No, you know who is a Terizosaurus Rex? 
any 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 girl with an accent um i've really been noticing this the last couple of days because i've been dealing with it and uh you know i've noticed that you can have like a, a cute latina accent speaking english with a latina accent and it'll make up for like 15 extra pounds it's like it just shaves them right off <laughs> And then I also realized the other day that there is nothing more lethal than a British accent uh, on a woman who is both in touch with her femininity and has a very high intelligent quotient. That is a fucking scary, scary, scary thing to listen to. (laughs) I mean, like, really... um, terrifying you know because not only is it you know attractive but you also it also kind of makes you feel stupid or something you know it's like they just sound like it's just not fair you know it's not fair people with cute accents definitely have like a serious advantage over the rest of us mortal fucking people americans you know i mean i had the swedish uh she was swedish and uruguayan indian like mix um I'm almost tempted. It would be wrong of me to take you guys to her Facebook page and show you this girl, wouldn't it? <laughs> that would be that would not be right of me. But it's amazing, man. You her her pictures, like some of them, and and it was crazy. She was simultaneously like from one minute to the next, she could be like the hottest girl you've ever seen in your life to the point where I was like afraid of her, almost. You know, she would just look at me. And I'm like shit. You know, and then, but she was also like the ugliest troll ever and it could, and it could flop back and she knew it. She said it to me one time and I couldn't believe she knew it, you know, because I was confused. Like she just kind of dumped herself on me, you know, kind of showed up at my house and just didn't leave. And, and, um, you know, I, I just, I was like, I was trying to figure out like, am I hallucinating or like. Is, is she like really always ugly? And I don't, and what is, what is this shit, you know? But it's like she wasn't human or something. And her mood would morph her fucking uh, entire appearance. Like she would start cleaning and I swear to God, she would morph into like a Hispanic maid. Like, uh, and then one time we, I was going to go do some pot deal or something. And um, she, I mean, why did I just say that out loud? <laughs> I mean, I was, I, I had to go to the rug store, um, cause that's where they were buying the pounds. I mean, that's where we were buying the rug. And, um, I looked over at her and she was kind of annoyed with me and bored. And like, she had gone into like bored Latina mode, like fussy, like lips all puffy. And like her hair that was normally straight had curled as if she'd been to the salon and was now only shoulder length because she needed to like morph into like a bored, annoyed Latina. It was insane. Like, how is that possible? It doesn't make any fucking sense, you know? So from one minute to the next, I had, I had like 18 girlfriends. You know what I mean? I should have been really happy about it because, you know, who, that's what everyone wants really is like, you know, 18 girlfriends. And she was. She was like 18 different girls. Um, and I saw her Facebook page the other day. I was scrolling through and I just could not fucking believe it. You know, I was like, I remember this. All these different girls that don't even look like each other at all. Some of them are butt ugly even. Some of them are devastatingly hot, and it's just this one chick. Like, I know probably some of you guys out there have known <laughs> women like this before. God, that was a wild one, though. She's the one that made me put tobacco juice up my butt because I was really mean, you know? I was really, like, I was under a lot of stress because I had two mentally disabled, insane partners running a pot giant pot farm I didn't know they were insane when I I started working with them. I didn't know that they were connected to a murder investigation that was connected to the property. They didn't have anything to do with the murder, but they did have something to do with it by proxy of the murderers bringing evidence to the house and one of them touching the evidence, Um, which is enough. (laughs) That's enough. So, you know, I'm finding all this stuff out and I'm like under all this pressure. So I'm tearing everyone's fucking head off, you know, and I'm also the band leader and we're practicing like 60 hours a week because we have this insane gig coming up and everything. And, and uh, she got tired of me just like biting everyone's head off. And she's like, you need to drink tobacco. And I was like, bitch, please, I'm not drinking tobacco. This is before ayahuasca or, you know, it was there's no way I'm drinking tobacco water 
You're out of your mind. And I've been studying shamanism forever. So, of course, I knew that there are tabaqueros that will drink tobacco until they have visions. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. But I have acid in my pocket. <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not finna drink no tobacco water. And so, but she was a psycho when she got to my house, you know, she was like moody and like, like it was, it was, she was just like, like every, like, like almost like a tweaker, you know, just like scurrying around all the time and bitching about things and, in a in like three different accents. Cause she spoke like Swedish, you, whatever Uruguayan indigenous people speak and Spanish, you know, like all mixed together and, and, um, it was like having a little miniature Viking indigenous woman like on a, on the rag or something, right? <laughs> you know? And, and, and she went out by the tree in the front yard one day and drank the tobacco and she came in and she hid for a while. And then she came out and she was so sweet and like docile and helpful and like, and I thought, okay, this is going to last for all of like two days and then she's going to be back in the fucking Viking indigenous woman fucking half breed lunacy shit again. And, um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, people look, the title says plant medicine and Western esotericism talk. So people are clicking on it thinking I'm still doing that. And it's been over for a while. So I'm sorry if you came for that. We're sort of on the same subject, but anyways, so she drank the tobacco and she was chill and sweet and and she kind of stopped morphing from an ugly chick to a hot chick back and forth all the time too you know like stabilized her whole countenance inside and out and so i was fucked i had no choice you know she had me by the balls literally and figuratively um <laughs> and so and so i was like all right damn it i'll drink the fucking tobacco and uh and so I went out to the tree with her and, and she handed me a coffee cup full of tobacco. And, and I was like, no, 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 no. I thought you meant like a shot or something. And I thought it was going to taste so bad. And I drank it down and it wasn't that bad. It was just kind of like really, really bad gas station coffee. And uh, nothing much really happened. I just felt like I smoked a pack of Marlboro Reds and then vomited. I don't even know if I vomited. I think I might have not vomited. Oh yeah, I didn't vomit. I didn't vomit. And she was all mad. She's like, you know, you didn't feel queasy. You have to vomit. So then she made me do it again. She's like, I'll make it stronger this time. And I'm like, Ugh. so, and this time she gives me a bowl full of it. She's like, you got to drink this. And so I drink it and I, I vomit. And this time I'm like, okay, I actually do feel like I just dumped some evil fucking thing out in the yard back there and it's gone now. And it was true. I was nicer, but it wasn't enough for her. <laughs> so she wakes me up the next day and she's like, come on, we have to go to Walmart. Um, no, no, no. You know what happened? Somebody paid me. So I had to go to Western Union, which was at Walmart. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm like getting the money from Western Union. And she comes up with like a colostomy bag and a, um, from the uh, pharmacy and like a, a tube or something, you know, something to put in your butt and some lube. And I'm like, what is this? And she's like, you're going to do a tobacco enema. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't know how she talked me into this stuff either. Um, because she didn't really have me like, you know, I wasn't really that. I was definitely not like super sexually into her or anything. Like, I, I don't know why I was letting her do this stuff to me. Um, like, I didn't even know if I wanted her around or not. <laughs> so so we get home and she, she, I go, I, 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 lay, I lay down on the bed and she plugs the thing in my butt and drains all of the tobacco juice into my intestines and makes me like clinch it in there. And then after it's been sufficiently long enough to almost kill me, I guess, she lets me go into the bathroom and get rid of it. And I come out and I feel like I've been raked over the coals. Like, I mean, it just incredible, you know, it's the tobacco is directly into your intestines. And I... <laughs> I come out and she takes my hands and she says, may whatever you have been holding fall to the center of the earth. And instantly it's like, <laughs> fuck.
fucking earthquake, literal fucking earthquake. Um, and I was thinking, you know, the the landlord must have hit his house, hit the house with his truck because he was blackout drunk all the time. And um, that's what happened. It was a literal earthquake. It was the first earthquake I'd ever been in my life. And um, it was insane. And um, I didn't really lose my temper like I used to, at least, again, for um, quite some time. The thing is, these these things will reassert themselves, you know, definitely over the last, like, year or so, uh, I realized that I, I had started to get kind of testy again due to, I think, excessive stress and whatnot. So you you do have to be vigilant. You can't expect these plant medicines to just, like, work and stay. It's basically, like, the longer the, the influence has maintained an imprint in your psyche and your emotional body, whatever it is, um, you, uh, you, you know, the, the, the longer it can reassert itself, I think. So you have to remain vigilant to keep these shits. Okay, let's move on next. <laughs> well, give me a subject then. I mean, I'm, I'm waiting for you guys. to ask me a question or give me a subject. Yeah, the tobacco enema is a traditional, <laughs> just keep talking, please. Um, is the ayahuasca as potent or similar to the last spot you were at? How does that work with the ingredients coming from different areas? No, I'm in the mountains. Um, there's no ayahuasca here, except for you know, in bags and stuff and in stores and whatever. Um, you can actually buy psilocybin mushrooms right off the shelf here. They're not legal, but I guess people just don't care. Um, yeah, the psilocybin mushrooms, for some reason, uh, ayahuasca is legal, uh, but if you get pulled over with it, you have to tell them, like, what farm it came from or, like, how you got it or, you know, because I guess the jungle's really protected and stuff. So, um it's not, it's sort of, you know, it's legal, but it's like, it's, you're not going to get like busted for possession exactly, but you have to be able to tell them where it came from if you get like in a roadblock. Um, and then San Pedro, I think is easier. It's just everywhere. It's like a weed. I mean, to make San Pedro illegal here, it's, it would be almost like making dirt illegal. It's literally like I could throw a rock in any direction right now and hit a San Pedro cactus. Not even kidding. Um, literally any direction. <laughs> yeah, the fences, the, the, um, the, they're not fences, they're walls, like brick walls. I mean, they function as fences, property perimeter brick walls. Uh, they all have San Pedro just planted on top of them because it's considered a protector. Partly because if you try to jump over a fence and there's a bunch of cactuses on it, you're going to get poked. Um, but <laughs> that's not really why. Um, we have a huge one at the corner of this property. Um, the ruins are covered. They're all around the ruins and stuff. Um, but the ayahuasca, the question is, um, non applicable because ayahuasca is from the jungle. Um, and, and I'm not in the jungle anymore, sadly. Nope. Estoy en las montañas. Ahorita. Por ahora. Capitán gringo loco de la selva. Es en la montaña. Es, es, está en la montaña. Yeah, you know, I don't always get it right quite. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, the different types of ayahuasca are all in the same parts of the jungle. There's red ayahuasca, black ayahuasca, yellow ayahuasca, and white ayahuasca mainly. And then, you know, the shuar were actually, shuar were so, um, they actually roll their tongues like far more than Spanish. You know, it's not shuar or shuar, it's shuar, shuar, shuar. <laughs> Especially with the ayahuasca songs, it gets really difficult to imitate that stuff. Um, but yeah, so black ayahuasca is supposed to be the strongest. Some people say that only brujas uh, or brujos or dark shamans work with it. That's, I don't think that's fair. Um, sounds racist even. 
Um, and then red ayahuasca is generally the most prized. Uh, and that's what I usually worked with in um, um, Ecuador. Uh, and then yellow ayahuasca is a lot easier to um, manage, I think, because it has less tannins than the black and the red. Um, so it doesn't make you as sick. It's kind of a light body kind of fluffy energy. The Shipibo like to use it a lot, and I don't blame them because it's, you know, it's not as brutal as a lot of the other types. Also, I think Chacruna is a lot easier um, to navigate than Chaliponga. Chaliponga is um, darker. The sort of entities you encounter. Um, maybe I should try to explain to you guys what I mean when I say that I don't believe in entities because it's not exactly that. Like, I think we need to come up with more subtle like, ways of thinking about real and not real. Um, because, you know, on the one hand, I have tested ayahuasca and DMT entities and the results are kind of like chat GPT-4 or something. Um, they're not quite online all the way or something. Um, but then again, there have definitely been numerous cases where um, ayahuasca entities and DMT entities have given me absolutely accurate information. So, you know what I mean? It's like, you can't really quite write it off, but I think the idea that the, like people believe in that there are parasitical entities attached to them and stuff is just not good. It's not, not good for your mental health, and it's not true. And even if it is true, even if someone removes it from you, you still, you know, it's like the space where it was is still that trauma and damage and all the unaddressed stuff is still there, you know. You, you, it doesn't just go away with this attachment. And the reality is, I think, that the, the visualization of the entity is not about the entity. It's a way to see where the problem is. And body, mind, spirit, all connected. So if you know how to read the symbolism, then you can see where something is attached and the way that it looks. And then there's all sorts of metaphorical, allegorical information that's communicated. And then so you know how to deal with the person, you know? It's, it's a way that the medicine allows us to communicate uh, with a more subtle layer of our being. But they're not literal entities. No, I'm working with San Pedro, psilocybin, huilca, ayahuasca, all of them. Um, but ayahuasca is going to take a back seat, whereas like in the jungle... It was mostly ayahuasca, and usually you would do like one San Pedro ceremony. Um, but here it's the Andean stuff, more, mostly, you know, wachuva and um, psilocybin and wilka. And wilka is basically uh, short asking, acting ayahuasca. And probably what we would do is take a small amount of just copy vine without um, chacruna, and then... Um, drink a moderate dose of San Pedro, and then at the end of the night, have the Wilka. And that would be one of the most amazing experiences of your entire existence, <laughs> for sure. Um, totally safe, too. Uh, so um, the only thing is, you know, Wilka is a little bit uncomfortable no matter what. Somebody was telling me um, in the chat the other day that there is a way to do it where there's no vomiting and no discomfort, but you don't really want that. And hit the like button, goddammit. You don't really want that necessarily to avoid the purging. Um, the thing is, with, with Wilka, it is far more than just, um, just purging. Like, this pressure builds in your body that makes you feel like you're going to explode and... It's it's rough. It's it's definitely rough. And what I found is that the San Pedro actually mitigates some of that difficulty. Ecuadorian and Colombian, ad <laughs> adorable <-erian. laughs> I can't find a good way to combine that word with 
with adorable Lurian. <laughs> no, it doesn't really work, does it? Adora Blumbian? <laughs> I don't know. Bueno Vini? Who is this Orbis Participe person? He has a new person in the chat. No DMT Chakruna? Right, yeah. Um, well, because the Huilka has the DMT, so um, what you're after in that case is the Harmalas. Yeah, well, Snort Huilka, yeah, you blow it into the nose. So um, there's a large pipe with two little putters on the end, and you put it in the nose and you go, <gasps> And then it sucks to be alive for a minute or so. <laughs> and then almost instantly, you start to feel kind of bad. And then there's like usually yellow and orange flashes. And then like a ball, like everyone sees the waiting room is the same way. There's this um, like ball that's like gyrating and like kind of, it has some geometries in it usually. And you know, it's just that DMT aesthetic weirdness. And then it goes faster and faster and faster and faster and you feel sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker and the vasoconstriction gets worse and worse and worse. So you get colder and colder and colder and the pressure is more and more and more building, 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 building. And then finally you're like poof into fucking full blown vision land and the medicine will start to present you with all sorts of interdimensional weirdness. Uh, and on, on the first occasion when I tried it, I was walking around in this park in Vilcabamba, which is Wilcabamba. It's named after the, the Wilka tree. And um, I'm walking around the park and I see them and I'm like, wait a minute, no way, that's Wilka. And I have, they're a little red flat and they have like almost like a plasticky coating on them. And then you put them in a frying pan and heat them up and they go poof, like kind of like popcorn blow up into like little sacks. The water, the water in the woody seed causes them to puff. And then you pull all that stuff off and you grind them up in a grinder with, uh, and then, well, before that, we take the giant snails and then put them in... Um, aluminum and then you put it in a fire and then they burn until they're ash so you can just and they just crumble <sighs> I just got really sad thinking about all of the times that, that I did all this stuff with my partner and wondering how we could do so much amazing stuff and then end up like this um but anyway, so you burn the snail, snail shells and then um, mix them with the, the woody pulp and um, then get it wet and mush it around and then dry it out and squish it again. And um, so I did that after I found them and um, I had to snort it. I didn't have anyone to blow. I didn't have a blower. Um, it's about a half gram, so it's an insane amount, and it drips down into the back of your throat and kind of tastes like some gross-ass peanut butter. It's not, it's not pleasant at all. I don't like it one little bit. And I went out to the back porch, and that happened, you know, with the pulsing ball, and, and I wasn't expecting much, you know. I was thinking, oh, I'll see some trails or colors or something. It's not going to be a big deal. And it was a big deal. And then I walked over to the edge of the um, back porch, and I looked out and there were like Toltec statues folding up out of the grass everywhere. And suddenly my partner was beside me and she's like, did it work? And I'm like, <laughs> so then I, I had to lay down and I don't think I vomited that time maybe, but I almost did definitely. And usually you do. Um, people black out a lot and like, you know, uh, there's a strange thing people tend to do when they take Wilco where they like put their hands up and vomit in their hands. I've seen it so many times. I have no clue why anyone would think, that, you know, why do people do that? On Wil Only with Wilco, they put their hands up and vomit in them. Like, dude, I, I gave you a bucket, man. What are you doing? No, no, no. It's just the snell, the shells. It's not... Um, I don't ever remember seeing Orbis Participe. Did you have a different handle? Because I remember people. Oh, I see. Used to be Macanalista. Oh, okay. That's it. Changed its name. But yeah, I mean, it causes telepathy that'll like hang. It's like a, a cold hangover that lasts for days. Um, where, uh, 
I don't know. One time I saw my 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 girlfriend. Um, um, her cat was like. It came in the room, and it was not a friendly cat. Like it didn't really like people most of the time. And she 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 goes, "I can talk to the cat." And 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 as soon as she said that, the cat came running over, jumped up on the bed, got right in her face, and like started meowing and like turning its head all weird. And I was like, "What the fuck is happening?" And then the cat got like really visibly upset, and started like rolling its face around in the blanket. And then my, my girlfriend started crying and they're both like meowing and I'm like, all right, man, no more of this, no more Yopo. This is not funny. So then the next day, um, I'm walking out of the, uh, property and you have to go through the neighbors, moo, moo, foo, um, moo, foo, foo, uh, is like weird hippie cult. And Mufufu walks up and he's like, hey, not like, hello, how are you doing? Nothing. He just goes, hey, do you think like consciousness is like a, an integrated like net and that sometimes we might have a telepathic experience with an animal? Like, why the fuck would he just randomly say that to me after I just watched my um, girlfriend uh, apparently telepathically communicate with a cat? Okay, so what's going on over here? Still got one lonely person in the other chat. <laughs> what would you recommend to someone who's been on the self-initiation path of ceremonial magic who would like some outside direction from someone further down the path? Um, well, if you're still here, Wesley, we... Wesley, we... Um, <clears throat> I mean, if you would like direction from me, I would, I would say join my Patreon and there's options of 15 minute, um, chats or 30 or, or an hour weekly. Um, otherwise, you know, there are certain books that are invaluable. Um, d d d dogma, what is it called? Morals and dogma by Albert Pike. Um, uh, the Book of Lies, but it requires, um, you know, some background. You have to know the Kabbalistic terms and um, the other mystical jargon that's mentioned in there. You know, you have to take the time to go and look it up and read things over and over again. And, and eventually, um, the thing is, like, if you are in the current of Gnosis, if you have hit the impulse, if you have aligned yourself with this process, um, hopefully like ideally what happens is that you kind of have these revelations and you come into certain types of knowledge um, before you encounter these writings. But then when you see them in the book, then you know that it's not just you and stuff in your head. You know what I mean? Um, it's very, very important that, that it happens that way. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I got lucky or maybe it wasn't luck, but I didn't really use the internet Uh, until, you know, I had already been through the bulk of the process, I guess, you know, at least the really intensive, um, peak of it. So, you know, I had all these 1111 experiences before I'd ever heard of 1111. I have no idea. I had no idea that it was a thing, you know, out there in the world, um, that sort of thing, you know, strings of numbers that were all three the same. I, 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 I had no idea that that was a thing. And I, I feel like that was really important because if you expose yourself to the stuff and then, and then you have the experiences, if you have objectivity and discernment, then you're going to have to ask yourself, well, am I just projecting this stuff because I read about it on the internet? <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, it's really important to make sure that you are genuinely 
catalyzing internal processes um, through psychedelics and book study of you know psychology and doing psychoanalysis and you know just I mean it's it's different for every person what um, sort of gets the juices flowing you know flow state is absolutely essential flow state is really just kind of a trendy name that yuppies are more comfortable with than transcendental consciousness they don't want to call it channeling they don't want to think of it as becoming an avatar they don't want to think of it as being a hollow tube to bring down fire from heaven and make some kind of expression out of it you know what I mean? They they would rather call it flow state and think that it's just uh, whatever. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a a, a trendy name for a transcendental state of mind. Um, but it's useful to um, kind of have context for um, and 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 also you know portals into that experience that aren't so abstract like a psychedelic experience or. Um, you know, a three day long masturbation binge or whatever it is, <laughs> whatever path it is that, that you choose. Pranayama is excellent. Pranayama is the best form of meditation. And the reason that uh, ceremonial mag magicians so often will begin their uh, ritual work, particularly rising through the planes where you try to expand and expand and expand and expand until you are merging with the Godhead because you have gotten so large that you have busted through the veil and you're the Adam Cadman, the macro prosopus now, right? Um, the fourfold breath. Um, the reason is that one of the main um, qualities that you need for alchemical transmutation is stability for the work, right? This is why the pyramid is the um, symbol, basically, of civilization, because it's the most stable geometric structure. Um, and if your apex is to surpass the stars, then how broad must be your base? <laughs> so um, that stability is uh, for the cube, right? Cubes are also pretty stable, not quite a pyramid, but um, the base of the pyramid. And this is this is this is a big, 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 big. Um, how would you say it's, it's something that is overlooked uh, very, very consistently that that the um, the square with its four points is the base of the pyramid, um, and I'll, I'll actually will I'll <clears throat> I've talked about this a few times on the channel, but this is a really good one. Uh, the lesser branching ritual of the pentagram um, generally follows uh, um, the fourfold breath and the rising of the planes because in the uh, Western occult tradition, it generally opens and closes every ceremonial um, working. So um, the fourfold breath, as I was saying, is uh, the beginning of the process because it is the stability, right? It is the square or the cube. Um, I mean, the chair has four legs for a reason. Um, and, you know, most animals do. I don't know why. It would be way cooler if we had four legs and two arms, I think. I would much prefer that. What was I saying though? Okay, so the fourfold breath. So inhaling for four, holding for four, exhaling for four, keeping distended for four. This causes um, inundation of the brain with oxygen and also the, the um, you know, um, deprivation of the brain of oxygen. Uh, and th that has a, a number of, of useful side effects, both of those phases, right? So, um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about the pyramid and the square and the philosopher's stone, uh, in the context of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram is that, you know, you have the circle that defines the microcosm, the energies you're managing, and then the shit outside of it is not your concern. So just whatever. <laughs> and, uh, so then you have the four directions, the four archangels, the four pentagrams, you know, this, all these fours. Um, and what you're doing is compressing information in each of those directions, right? So these symbols are getting packed with um, uh, their compressed information. And um, this 
this bit though, um, if you add the fifth element, which is light, uh, to the equation directly above you, so you have the four points within the circle and then you have one above you, if you connect lines to the points on the, in the four directions, to the point directly above you, assuming you're in the cent center of your temple or wherever you're working, uh, now you have a pyramid. And what is at the top of the pyramid? The eye. So what is it that makes the universe a habitable, um, functional space? The introduction of light, which is consciousness. So um, just such a beautiful uh, ritual elucidation of universal process. And you have to think about what you're actually doing when you go through this process of establishing the four corners, the four directions, the four elements, the four archangels, the four fundamental forces of physics, and you're orienting all that stuff with you as the center anchor point and the, um, the tie that binds is the light and consciousness that exists above your head. In the space in the, in the Kabbalistic system it is called Keter. Maybe I'm getting too tired for this. I, 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 I don't know. Let me see what the chat has to say. What is that Gidsi berate? Looks like we're not speaking English there a little bit. No, nope, that's definitely not. Do I have a translate button here? Nope. I could make you a moderator though. I didn't know it was that easy to make someone a moderator. You can just like, here, let's make, um, Where's, oh, you guys speak the same language. What is that? What language is that? It's like Czech or something. Serbian. I'm going to make... A luminostic a moderator. I'm going to give her full power to moderate. I don't know which one's which one's more powerful. Okay, standard moderator, there you go. Now you're like in charge of stuff. <laughs> Anyways guys, I'm not really seeing a lot of opportunity for interaction here and it is 11 o'clock and I'm gonna kill this one chat and then I'm gonna come over to the remaining chat and I'm gonna give you guys a minute to Ask me stuff. Hey, look at that. <laughs> I gave her superpowers. <laughs> Everyone's sub to Illuminostic life. That's that's a good that's a good one. Um What is the language, dude? You guys didn't tell me, dickheads. Croatia? Oh, Serbian. Hey, I did guess Serbian. Croatian and Serbian. Man, I've had a rough go of it with Croatians. The only person I ever had come to a retreat that I did not, like, I had to kick him out. The only time I ever had to kick anyone out. This kid, man. Everything I told him not to do, he just did it. Like, the neighbors were allowing us to pick mushrooms in their cattle fields, and I told him, go under the fence. That's all you have to do. I'm not telling you you can't go. Just go under the wire. Don't go over it. So he went over it and broke the fence. Like, the one thing. And then I gave him some changa. And we decided on a break that we were going to go to this um, kind of traditional restaurant and get like patacones. And he lit up the chonga in this like nice restaurant. 
I, I just I couldn't believe it, man. It was it was just complete lunacy. But yeah, and then I um, the next Croatian guy that I I, I ran into, I I got into it with him pretty badly too. We should all be in a Skype session. Yeah, we have been thinking about um, doing that with the patrons um, lately. Try to create group chats with the patrons. Ugh. Remember that dude I met at the Laguna? I forgot his name, but he stayed with you. Is he still a part of the community? He stayed with me? The dude you met at the Laguna? I only brought Enrica with me, I thought. I brought Enrica and my son, and we had the monkey. Drinking Ragija? I don't know what the fuck that is. Um, no, I don't know what you're talking about. The dude you met that stayed with me at the lagoon. Oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He went there first on accident. Um, <laughs> no, that guy, he didn't stay with me. He was this super cool plumber. Dude from, um, I haven't heard from him in a minute, man. Uh, but he, he actually came and just scooped us up and took us all expenses paid to, um, uh, Cubayeno, which is like deep, deep in the Amazon. Uh, you know, they'd have like indigenous people take you in a canoe way out in a river and you're like in a lake. It's just basically a shallow lake, this huge shallow lake. And there was anacondas and all sorts of monkeys. We saw macaws. It was the real deal, man. That was the deepest in the jungle I've ever been. That was really nice of him to just come and just take us. He paid for the hotels. Um, but he, he had just gotten a pretty fat stack. <laughs> so, um, But the interesting thing about that guy, man, he wasn't really into the occult. He wasn't into the mysteries he just thought he liked my guitar playing and he also just thought it was cool that i just don't give a fuck about <laughs> being a normal person i guess you know like he just really liked the fact that i don't fit into any kind of categorization i guess and i don't really try to conform to any kind of stereotype or whatever and maybe i do maybe i do try to conform to the stereotype of a rebel or something without it's definitely not deliberate, I promise that. Who is Jadranksko? What are you guys talking about? We got all these Eastern Europeans in the chat tonight talking all kinds of weird shit that they only only they understand. Jabote me it's Evrop He's probably talking a hell of shit right now. I guess I'm the one-to-one -one Skype call subscriber level. Just never got around to it yet. Well, that's on you, dude. I mean, you know, you can even add up all of your 10-minute things and then make me talk to you for four hours, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, I do have one of those that, like, he just he just doesn't do it forever, and then he'll just hit me up and we'll just talk for four hours or whatever, and then it's like... Well, we're good for this year now, I guess. <laughs> Join my Patreon, you bastards. It's it's shrunk. It has. It's shrunk. It was up to $700. Now it's $555. It's the lowest it's been in months. I'm so sad about it. So make me happy again. Go and sign up so that I can continue to wander around the planet being weird, <laughs> I guess. What are you guys talking about? I have to try to drink what? 
what is this stuff? Can you explain? I missed Jadransko. Non te preocupas todos. That's almost Spanish. What are you telling me? Serbian is like almost, are you, are you just like writing really bad Spanish or something? <laughs> I don't understand. Cool, man. Would love to chat. Just been working like crazy. Yeah, man. I mean, claro. Uh, so for those of you that just popped in, I was about to go away, but if the crowd is growing, then, but you have to ask me something, you know, I'm, I'm going to go get some blueberries in a minute and come back. And hopefully by then you guys will have a topic for me. Oh, it's a very strong alcoholic drink that you love. I've sworn off alcohol, man. I realized that like it's just not good. I, I've known that my entire life. Um, but sometimes I forgot and that's not good. It's just not good. You should just never drink it. All right. I'm going to go get some blueberries. And when I come back, if there's something, I mean, it can even be topical, political, um, you know, heterosexual, homosexual. Um, ask me what it's like to be the fastest crab in Minnesota. <laughs> I'm competing with someone else for that title, actually. Lucid dreaming and astral projection. Um, lucid dreaming, I think, um, <clears throat> one of the objectives I have lately is to um, reestablish like a significant degree of, of lucidity for myself. Um, <clears throat> I'm more significant degree, and I think, you know, if you guys were watching earlier, um, when um, Ariel, I think, suggested that lucid dreaming through life was um, the real objective. That is absolutely true. I, I think that uh, I've, I've, I've managed to get to that state in the past. It's very difficult to maintain, and it's very easy to destroy. It's also um, highly conducive to uh, ego inflation, which happens for sure, because I'm like, well, clearly I'm God because everything I think just happens. So, <laughs> you know, that's what happens a lot of a lot of the time. And then the consequence of that, of course, is that you end up destroying everything that you <laughs> that you created, um, which is what a God would do. But the God would allow the thing to fully take course first. <laughs> um. And so, you know, I, I think the key kind of is that when you realize that you are dreaming when you're sleeping, you can do anything you want. And the same thing is true in your waking life. So, um, 
it's definitely a, a very helpful opportunity to train, you know. It's an opportunity to train for doing it in real life. I feel like I'm already starting to kind of reemerge into that kind of consciousness lately due to shock and um, sort of uh, brutal sort of humbling, I guess. And if you think about it, I mean, no, I would love to have African Dream Root. In fact, if any of you guys come to see me, I might recruit you to bring some of these things. Cause it's very difficult to order stuff here. Um, but God, I really wish I had access to some of those tools. Um, but what I'm saying, I guess, is that it's very, very difficult to master lucid dreaming. Um, the key, I think, you know, when I've, I've tried this in the past, persistence is key because you have to keep trying for a long period of time and then day in, day out, you get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit better. Uh, people get discouraged. I got discouraged. Um, another thing that is extremely helpful but extremely dangerous is um, toe. Um, it's not dangerous if you stay below a certain threshold and also just, you know, take a little bit at a time until you figure out what's doable. Um, but you got to be really careful. I'm not advising anyone to do that. Uh, but for me, it's fine um, because I, I do it all the time. And I, I, I think I, I, I talked a little bit about this on um, recent stream where I, I – I was experimenting with the local strain, which I could tell by the terpenoid profile that it was going to be way, way stronger. Um, and I thought that I backed it up enough, and I did for safety, you know, but not for sanity um, exactly. And so, you know, that night um, I couldn't distinguish between dream state and wake at all, like not at all. It was like... It was, I mean, there's no words. Um, and the only reason I knew that I was going from from sleep to wake is that when I really woke up the next day, uh, some of it was so surreal that I knew it couldn't have happened. You know, like money falling through my hand in the middle of my hand and like some guy was explaining the thumbnail that I was going to generate the next day with AI, which I did generate somehow. <laughs> and it had the symbols on it. So it, it gives you clairvoyance too. Um, doing dream work with uh, Datura is a common shamanic practice in the Andes and other places. Um, but you just, you got to make sure you know what you're doing because a little bit too much and you're not likely to die, but you are likely to like run around naked in your neighborhood and, you know, wake up in jail or something. So, the best thing to do um, is probably to use something like Chirik Sananga if you're interested in that, but you lack experience um, because it's like much more mild. But I'm sure uh, it will help with the, the lucid dreaming. Blue Lotus also. Um, I think is 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 really good for that. Also, it 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 it, it, it like attenuates your. Um, it's like it doesn't really get you high. It just sort of like pops your third eye open a little bit more or something. I don't know. It's like the sort of twilight feeling, for me, anyways. Um, and just connecting with that modality of consciousness. I think makes the transition into like lucid daydreaming, wake, wake. I don't know how to say it, you know, lucid dreaming while you're awake.
basically it's like <clears throat> if you can maintain the portal between the conscious mind and the subconscious to the highest degree that you can without losing focus that's really the key to um accessing that kind of state if that makes sense you know where you're really sort of living a lucid dream yeah that that night with the toe man like I when I when I fell asleep, I knew that I had like coins in my bed. I saw them, but I was so tired I didn't care. So like I would wake up and I would see the coins and I would try to pick them up and then they would just like fall through my fingers and I I couldn't understand because I could see crystal clear and I could think like I was just a normal waking state. And now I don't know whether I was awake and imagining that the coins were actually, or hallucinating that the coins were falling through my hand because that's the kind of thing that deter, that tropane alkylates can do. Um, you know, or if I had fallen asleep and I was imagining it and then I would wake up and see the coins and then pass out again and try to pick, you know. And then it, sometimes my partner was there handing them to me, and I knew she wasn't there because she's thousands of miles away. So, my favorite color I used to always say is blue, but I think black. It's probably my favorite color. Astral projection is an interesting idea because I I don't really, you know, I haven't made up my mind exactly what the astral is. Um, earlier we heard Ariel say that um, that um, Flow state I've been able to access actually surprisingly well. The last stream or so that I did, I don't know if it was the last one or way well, the last one I did in Polkalpa maybe, um, where I played some of my best ever, I think, um, in that way. And which is hard to believe because the guitar is almost unplayable. I mean, it's such a struggle to play it. Um, so it's it's it was weird to see that you know that I was able to overcome the the difficulties and do it um but what was there was another oh about um the astral astral projection um there are different modalities of that I think you know when uh Ariel was talking about the astral plane as like when you when you have like a lower level DMT experience and it's very bright colors and all of this stuff that that's actually no my my real guitar is still in the states um it's a long story i bought this guitar in ecuador and and traveling in the jungle is what fucked it up um but you know for example when people take a disassociative like ketamine um sometimes they'll report being able to see 360 degrees and also people have been able to talk about conversations that happened in like different rooms of the house and, or, you know, different the places they couldn't have heard. Um, I, I had a friend once described like he, he came out of his body and he was hovering in the ceiling and he could see 360 and he watched his body get up and walk to the bathroom and projectile vomit from the door directly into the toilet without spilling any and then walked back to the bed and lay down and then he went back into his body and got up and checked and the vomit was in the toilet and not anywhere else you know that kind of stuff um so that that sort of thing where you're just like in the normal world but you're out of your body i guess that's not really astral projection 
Um, and in those low level DMT experiences where everything's very chaotic and brightly colored and stuff, I don't associate that with the astral plane. The astral plane is supposed to be, you know, in the traditional conception of the Western occult tradition, it is a plane of living symbols, if that makes sense. And so it's kind of like an invert inverse of um, the world where like sentient beings are beings and symbols are inert. It's sort of the reverse of that. Um, and so th there's sort of a different modality of communication and a different layer of our existence can be sort of discerned and understood and interacted with. Um, Yeah, and then there's also the imaginal plane, which I, I think is also different. Um, the astral plane, I kind of think of as the wiring under the board, the um, operating system for our universal consciousness. Um, and then I remember as a child uh, having these experiences where I was like, it's not like a dream exactly, but I would be I would be hearing this voice that I kind of knew was God or something, and I would be flying over these like worlds, you know, um, very difficult to explain, um, but definitely not like dream, not like daydreaming, not like imagination, like some other plane. Uh, and also there was always this like eerie familiarity, you know, like I had been there infinite times before and, and like I knew what it was or something, but I didn't, you know, like some part of me was profoundly familiar with these weird, um, places that I would go during these experiences. And honestly, I, I don't really know when they would happen looking back. Like, you know, was, was I just like sitting in a chair or. I think I think I remember sometimes it would happen when I was like in the back seat of a car going somewhere on a long ride and I had time to just let my mind go. Um But yeah, I th I think there are all these different um planes of our consciousness that actually literally exist, you know, that that we all can experience and access and they they might have um you know, some intrinsic details that are like a little bit different, but they're discernibly, you know, the same, like the imaginal plane versus the astral plane versus um, the three different planes of the DMT experience. You know, that's an interesting thing because people pretty much ubiquitously describe them as, you know, the same, the, the waiting room is orange and pulsing and there's weird geometries and you know what I mean? That sort of thing where it's, um, it's kind of like a map, you know, like we, it's a place just like the pyramids are a place or the Andes are a place, you know, and you know how to get there. This small amount of DMT takes you to the waiting room and, you know, a plane ticket to PSOC takes you to PSOC. It's, sort of the same. Dream looping? I'm not familiar with that as a concept. Yeah, keeping a dream journal is an extremely wise plan. One of the reasons is that precognitions do occur during dream state. And also there is a dialogue between the subconscious and the conscious mind um, that can intersect at wide intervals in time, right? So let's say you have a dream um, like, for example, for me, I had a dream, I woke up, and I wrote, like, the great chief spoke through the smoke of a time that was near, but not to have fear, and all that. I don't even know how I remember those first lines, but I guess because it turned out to be really significant, right? 
And some like a year later or something, I found myself in the presence of Golden Light Eagle, the Sundance Sioux chief, talking about, you know, exactly what was written in this paper. And so the, the point is that if you don't keep a dream journal and you have that kind of precognition, you're just going to be thinking like, wait, didn't I dream this at some point? You know, whereas if you've actually documented it, then you have certainty and you're like, no, it's right here. I actually fucking did write that. I did dream this, you know. So that kind of practice is essential for people that are not interested in faith. You know, you want to know the truth. You want to know what's real and what's not and not allow your mind to take fanciful flights and just believe stuff because you, you want to or, you know, you like it. It's definitely um, better to know, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's getting late. Hit the like button, share, subscribe. Support me on Patreon, Zelle, PayPal, Cash App. You can also email me your soul. I'll 3D print it, place it in my little dungeon. Can you roll a joint? Come on, man. I mean, what do you? What the hell do you think? <laughs> I don't smoke pot. I don't like pot. I don't see any reason to smoke pot, for the most part. Um, you guys got to be able to come up with something, some some kind of question for me to answer, or to, to try to answer, or to avoid answering. You know why I guys I, I like you know why I guys it is getting late. Um, you know why I like Casey Rocket so much. <laughs> Do you guys know, all know who Casey Rocket is? If you don't, you need to know who Casey Rocket is. He deserves to be far more famous than he is. There's this certain type of West Coast psychedelic mind that I all it was like all my heroes, you know, Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary, like this kind of like weird humor that is just kind of like loony and just off the wall. No one gets it anymore. Like no one's, it's, I just, I can't believe it. You know, you guys don't eat enough acid. I'm tired of it. It's got to come back. This kind of like, you know, acid bent humor that, and, and Casey, Casey Rocket is, is kind of, the, the only thing is he's not like deep. And the thing is the, the, the kind of style that I have in mind, you know, is generally there was some kind of like obtuse depth <laughs> to it. Casey Rockets just like a bunch of like warped crack jokes. Remains the the nasty heck of latest geopolitical war. Wow, what the what kind of sentence is that? You didn't sleep since yesterday night. Tell us what. Like you guys are just like putting random stuff in the chat. I, I realize that you're not your English isn't any of your first languages mostly, but Remains the nasty heck of latest. What does that mean? What are you asking? It has a question question mark. The latest geopolitical war. Um, yeah, war sucks. I mean, what do you want me to say? A bunch of fucking greedy overlords killing people because they just get off on it or something. I, I don't know. It's not even about the money. That's the thing. That's what's always gotten me, you know? I mean, maybe I just, like, I think more deeply about things, so I project. So it, maybe it is just about the money, and I just can't imagine that. But...
Casey Rocket. Oh, tell us. We can watch him. Um, we we could watch some Casey Rocket. I don't know if it'll shut my stream down for it or not. Because they might be like, you know, this is copyrighted, bitch. So we should... funny man i know that when people you know they think plant medicine um they're not expecting to, <laughs> to, to you know i'm just i'm just a little bit of a anomaly oh i can't get out of dual mode i can't get out of dual mode while already streaming so it matters not i just hope it kills a lot do you guys like guar guar is the shit been turning people on to guar lately all right so let's see um let's just see what we just randomly get when i put casey <laughs> Oh no, man! You guys, my whatever reputation I have is about to be destroyed. People, people come flooding on here expecting, you know, enlightened plant medicine shit, and I got Casey Rocket making jokes about drinking Robitussin and shit. Casey Rocket. This stream has devolved. <laughs> All right, so. Oh, I never made it as a wise man. <laughs> Get real, real trap shit. Come on. Fastest guy in the room who gives a shit. Come on. <laughs> Got to keep moving, fellas. Putin's trying to triangulate my position right now. <laughs> Get lost. Come on. Oh, back into Parmesan? Okay, we're having fun. Is it me, guys, huh? Get real. <laughs> I'm doing an hour and a half. Who gives a fuck? We're closing it down. <laughs> Fucking pranked your ass. Come on, man. Damn, a roast comic and a prop comic? What is this? The worst shit you've ever fucking seen? God damn, Putin hates this motherfucker. He can't stand me, boys, I'll tell you. <laughs> hey, Putin, I got five words for you, sweetie. Never made it as a wise man. Come on. Yeah, <laughs> He's up here riffing our hearts out, boys. Come on. <laughs> I won't lie to you folks, I got six more harmonicas hidden around the room here tonight. In six minutes, the room will start filling with water. You have six minutes to find the remaining harmonicas. <laughs> you didn't think the crab was bluffing, did you? <laughs> Big pranks daily. Yeah, I used to prank myself all the time in college. It was called what? Taking Xanax. Who's with me, boys? Huh? <laughs> I was like, hey, Casey, hear me out. I know you got an 8 a.m., but what if you woke up in jail? Okay. <laughs> Never made it as a wise man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I've had a lot of weird jobs in my life. I used to strip copper off Malaysian Flight 370. Uh, <laughs> before it took off. Uh, <laughs> That's on me. Come on. <laughs> Scientists can't stand me. <laughs> I just got diagnosed with reverse Benjamin Button's disease last week. <laughs> That's where I age normally, but I what? Still have the penis of a baby. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Guys, the Stuart Little stuff's working. Come on. Oh, it's not Stuart Little. Hey, I got some for you. It's a picture of Grimace during the fall of Berlin. So, <laughs> uh, we're having fun. <laughs> 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 
I just put, yeah, you just put it, you want to pass it around? <laughs> Everybody take a peek at it. Everybody gets a turn. Everybody gets a turn. Okay. I got something for you guys. It's a second picture of Grimace at the fall of Berlin. So, guys, <laughs> get eyes up front. Come on. <laughs> I come from old money. I got hundreds of these things. I got briefcases full of shit like that. You would not believe it. Fucking Biden's pissed. Trust me. I come from old money. My dad was that paperclip on Microsoft Word. I don't even need to be here tonight. <laughs> Talking about how can I help you. For starters, he could have drove me to football practice. You know I mean? <laughs> Drunk bastard. <Yeah. laughs> but that was dad. That was dad. I'm going to Blair Witch this set. <laughs> never what, never who what, wise man. <laughs> Nights like these, I always think about my grandpa, folks. When I was a kid, my grandpa used to always, always sit down and he used to always give me the best advice. He used to always sit me down and go, <laughs> you know, That was grandpa. You know. He was almost completely nonverbal. You know, it's just the way he was. And when he did talk, it was always about industrial society and its future, you know, but that was grandpa. He was a Unabomber, you know what I mean? This is the 90s, you could unibomb back then, okay? Come on now. Here's the thing about taking pills, folks. <laughs> if you don't want me to take so many pills, <laughs> don't make them so small. Uh, <laughs> If Oxycontin was the size of cheeseburgers, nobody would overdose on it. <laughs> oh, no thanks, I couldn't possibly have another Perk 30. I've had three, dude, I'm stuffed. <laughs> I could eat 200 Ambien. I could keep 200 Ambien right now. Fucking Pelosi couldn't do a thing to stop me either, I'll tell you. <laughs> I could eat 200 Ambien and still have enough room in me to eat a Philly cheesesteak while I'm checking all the car door handles in my apartment complex. <laughs> Never who what wise man. Thank you guys. I'm Casey Rocket. Wow. 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 So in case you guys are wondering what it's like in my head, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Did they, did they not let it play? It says, we've detected video in your stream belonging to someone else. Your stream may be temporarily fucking... <laughs> Why would they do that, you know? Like, what's the point? Like, can't they just pay... Can't they just, like, pay, pay the person for the views or whatever? I, I don't understand. Did they, did you guys, did it play for you? Heads up. I can't believe it says heads up. It's, it's really weird warning. Heads up. We've detected your shit maybe temporarily fucking donezo. Did you get hacked? Yeah, I don't know, like, like, <clears throat> um, it, it <laughs> what happened to that guy, you know, but I think it involved a lot of drugs, probably. <laughs> the weather with Casey Rocket, let's see if I can get myself. Do you enjoy story. learning about the news? Yeah. Well, guys, your next news correspondent's here to tell you all about the weather. Please give it up for Casey Rocket. Rocket man. Give it up. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> no need. No need. Thank you. <laughs> Turn it off. Thanks. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, I would have worn something nicer if I knew the Grimsh was going to be here. Uh, <laughs> as many of you know, the Grimsh is a total bitch. Grimsh, Grimsh is this. Uh, folks... <laughs> 
<laughs> Grimsh, as many of you know, Grimsh is this. Folks, let's jump right into it. Got a lot of weather to talk about today. Uh, the, this has nothing to do with it. I, my, it's laundry day, right, boys? Uh, <laughs> as many of you know, it's quite literally cloudy with a chance of meatball. Um, <laughs> uh, notice I didn't say meatballs. It's one big old fucking meatball. It's fucking... <laughs> A damn meatball the size of Corpus Christi is positioned right over Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I called the, the Rotterdam Institute. Am I talking loud? No. It's over my ears. No. Nope. Grimsh? <laughs> is the Grimsh here? Folks, I called the Rotterdam... Oh, back to the meatball thing. I called, a, <laughs> I called the Rotterdam Institute of Meatball, and the Grimsh... This isn't the Grimsh. <laughs> the Grimsh is gone. Forget the Grimsh. <laughs> this is the meatball impact zone. And if you notice, it is dark brown, just like meatball. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. I believe meatball juice has been dripping on this area for millennia. Uh, as, <laughs> as many of you know, the first astronaut was horse. I'm going to get to the meatball thing. Trust me. So as more and more har horse enter atmosphere, more and more horse die. And it costs more money to bring them back down to Earth. So, U.S. government say, why don't we leave a couple horse in orbit, eventually, comet tail, and also sun rays. Look at me when I'm talking about meatball, you fucks. <laughs> hey, there's a man up here in a purple suit talking meatball, you pieces of shit. And, and, and another thing, uh, some of these horse make big meatball. Up next, <laughs> up next, plug watch. As many of you know, I've eaten 12 earplugs in the last seven days. <laughs> I thought they were Totino's pizza roll because I never had one until <laughs> uh, <laughs> until quite recently when I went to grocery store and I realized what I've been eating is quite possibly not Totino's pizza roll at all. It's most likely earplug. <laughs> I went to my OBGYN and he diagnosed me with having 12 earplug in my esophagus and also my cervix. <laughs> I don't know what any of those words mean, but that's okay. Up next, bitch bug. I found this big old nasty bitch ass bug last week as many of you know I don't drive I take my Roomba everywhere and uh, <laughs> so to get from point A to point B takes quite possibly weeks at a time given the location because if <laughs> if Roomba even hit a crack in the sidewalk wah, wah, other direction and I go fuck I was so close you know what I mean I was in I was within earshot of church I, I'm at any given moment I'm going to church uh, <laughs> So anyway, what was I talking about? Meat oh, bitch yeah. bug. Oh, almost forgot. The meatball thing's over. Y'all are fucked. Uh, <laughs> there's no way to stop a meatball of that caliber. So I'm riding my Roomba, and I see this bitch-ass stinky bug. Can I describe what it looked like? No. Just looked like nasty bug. So I see bug sitting there. He's doing a face, something like this. <laughs> okay. He's doing it like that. I go, okay, this bug's got a fucking attitude problem, right? <laughs> This bug needs somebody, might need somebody to rough him up. So I start walking, then I start hearing the bug squeal. Sure enough, barn owl is coming for bug. So I pick up my Roomba, which is my only mode of transportation. I smash the owl to pieces right in front of Corporal Johnson, president of uh, Austin Police Department. So, <clears throat> folks, bear with me. <clears throat> owl is dead, and bug is staring at me like, like, not even happy that I smushed Owl, right? Which is fucking so stupid. Mike, get off your phone. I'm in a purple suit. Guys, <laughs> Mike, shh, eyes up here. Uh, <laughs> Mike, meatball thing. <laughs> go ahead and uh, go ahead and put those up. Where's the Grimsh? <laughs> the Grimsh! <laughs> <laughs> Guys, where are you, Grimshman? <laughs> what did you say, Grimsh? Is he talking? <laughs> All I'm hearing out of your bitch ass, man. I'll talk, no action, Grimsh. <laughs> Who wants to see the purple man kick the Grimsh's ass? Huh? <laughs> hey, man, there's about to be a nightmare on this street, bitch. <laughs> nightmare before Christmas. Yep, yep. That's a simulation of what goes on in my mind day in, day out. <laughs> Yep, it's devolved to that point, man, where Illuminostics' streams have just become fucking Casey Rocket clips. <laughs> yep. 
mirror the image? How? What do you mean? How do you do that? I should steal his riffs. <laughs> Theater report on the weather. It is Casey Rocket. Casey Rocket, everybody. Okay. I don't know about you guys, but I'm here ready here. I don't know. Yeah, I'm ready here to weather. Okay, here they come, 76ers. Clap your hands for the 76ers. All right, basketball stuff. 10, 9, 8, 76ers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Sixers. All right, basketball stuff. I know that's Fuzzy's thing, but I kind of play by my own rules. <laughs> Folks, let's get serious for a second. First on the docket today, since when did it become cool to put a slug on a paper airplane and throw it off the top of your apartment building? Folks, when I... <laughs> we all know the classic medical and scientific conundrum. Two slug per paper airplane, the airplane don't fly. Problem is, <laughs> as, the atmos as the ozone layer is getting... And this is weather, and this is weather... And because air is weather and cloud is sky. <laughs> As many of you have recently heard, cloud is sky. And, <laughs> and slug eat mud, which is part of nutrient of weather. Uh, but, uh, and oh, God. We've all, ah, we've seen the trend on TikTok. You put two slugs on a paper airplane and you throw it off your apartment building while Rihanna's hit song, We Don't Stop the Music, plays, and then a slug fly, and NATO's having a field day with these things. Because some of these slugs are learning to fly on their own. <laughs> Now, oh, none of our buildings are safe. There's all these little, and about, the, <laughs> and they look like little guns, too, which is scary. Oh, ooh, I got to chill. Ah, I got to chill. Ah, oh, my God. I'm so hot and cold at the same time. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on methadone, and I see this little gun. It looks like a flying gun, so I take out my gun. I have two guns, and <laughs> I start fucking, it's an automatic pistol, go, 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 and I start shooting this slug, It hits, and my bullet hit a real airplane, and it crashed. Guys, number two. <laughs> Folks, number two. The moon, the space moon race. <laughs> the space race. Folks, if you want the moon so bad, here's an idea. America, let's put a gorilla on the moon and shave all its hair and spray paint an American flag on its chest. And if you want the moon so bad, come and fucking take it. <laughs> we got a silverback gorilla up there. <laughs> Trained in Muay Thai, and he does not take any prisoners, especially Russians, and he is so mean, and that's weather. There's weather on the moon. It's, cl it's a cloud. Yeah. Up here, as you can see, there's recently been a very big cloud going into space. It's leaving the Earth's atmosphere, and the sun also is gone. It's fucking bye-bye, <laughs> bye-bye, eternal darkness forever. And, and some of this stuff's pretty scary to think about, actually. And, and that brings me to my next point. <laughs> uh, my next point, the changeling. What to do if your son shows up to your wife's birthday party and his eyes are made of mud? Well, folks... <laughs> Many people have been discussing their sons coming back from the woods recently with no eyeballs and their blood is made out of mud now. Very spooky conundrum to think about. And up, and up, <laughs> hmm, and up next, all right, for thousands of years, <laughs> for thousands of years, Native Americans have done peyote. But when I do, <laughs> when I do peyote and I go to PetSmart, I'm not allowed to adopt a snake. This is false. This should not be the case. <laughs> this is patently false, and it's starting to piss me off, actually. Because I keep doing peyote, and I keep showing up, and they go, wait till you sober up. And I go, I don't want to get sober. And you shouldn't have to tell me to, because I want to... I look for three qualities in a snake, folks. The silent gamer type. Uh, <laughs> the silent gamer type... Uh, the rowdy gentleman, of course. Uh, that's the type of snake that wears a monocle and he has a very small top hat and he only drinks really good rye whiskey. And then, of course, Helen of Troy. So, <laughs> Helen of Troy is this big old snake I saw one time when I was on peyote. And <laughs> it's so hot and it has huge big naturals. And... <laughs> 
Uh, basically, we all fought, like me and a thousand clockwork elves fought for this snake's love. You you weren't there, but you could be if you did peyote with me. And <laughs> I don't, what I'm trying to say is that some of these, some of these laws now about snakes are crazy. And they shouldn't be that way. Up next, Goose Watch. How to know... <laughs> How to know if my goose has eaten too many of those little tablets that expand to dinosaurs when you put them into water? Okay. Well, this is a pretty easy one. If your goose has eaten two or more of these, it is fucking dead. Absolutely. Uh, I know from personal experience, when I was a kid, I used to put them in my urethra, and they would blow up three or four times the size, and I would walk into dinner, and I would go, I'm the uh, bronchosaurus, and they would go, call the ER, call the ER. <laughs> Because it shuts off your blood. A lot of people don't know this. The penis is like a, it's like a funnel of, of blood that when the blood get you know what I'm saying. When the blood, <laughs> it acts as a natural barrier. The blood bounces off the tip of the wiener and it shoots back into your aorta. And when you have all these dinosaur guys in there walking around, it's scary, it's scary, it sounds scary, but it's not, it feels really good. Um, <laughs> it feels really good. <laughs> Um, it blocks the blood or something like that. So it's, but when a goose does, I think a goose could eat three. I think a goose could eat three. And as you can see, that is the goose. <laughs> and he's reaching for a little dinosaur pellet. <laughs> come on, come get it. Oh, it's trying to eat several. So you can eat three. You can eat three. Um, <laughs> and he's clocked on radar. So that's good. I mean, keep track of these fucking guys for once. And this is the goose impact zone. As you can see, Austin is lousy with goose right now. <laughs> there are over 700 goose in this area. Now, Corpus, you go down to Corpus, not one goose. Nice place to live, Corpus. Not one goose down there. So you can see, you can keep track of that right there. Okay. <laughs> Have a good night, guys. Happy weather. Casey Rogan. Casey Rogan with the weather. <laughs> Easily the funniest person that ever lived. <laughs> I'm here. <coughs> Good boy, here with a nice glass warm of tuss. Nice glass warm of <coughs> choking on nuts. All right, dude. I guess. Um, oh, no. Casey Rocket Paranormal Investigator. All right, you guys ready? For, you guys ready for no. your next segment? Come on, give it up for this correspondent. Right now, make it loud. For Gert Billis, a paranormal investigator, everybody. Oh my God. <laughs> spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down my spine. Spooky, scary, spooky. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down my spine. Spooky, spooky skeletons. Do you guys feel that? <laughs> Who was just up here? Oh, Fuzzy Kilji. Fuzzy Kilji. Okay. <laughs> okay, that makes sense, doesn't it? All right. <laughs> that about makes pr Are you guys okay? <laughs> You've been exp Let me check your neck. Oh, sweetie. <laughs> oh my God, you're freezing. Oh, you smell like shit. Yo, you both smell. <laughs> Oh, honey, you've been exposed. Oh, sweetie. Okay. All right. I didn't want to have to do this, but folks, we're going to have to break down the rules of ghost hunting so you boys can get rid of your ailment. Up first, some people meditate. Me, I just smoke cigars and drink whiskey. Up next, folks, ghost hunting's very easy. Ghost hunting is very, very tragically easy. It can all be broken down like this. Labia. L, locate. Okay, I think I found a ghost. Great. <laughs> Moving on. A, accuse. I know you're a fucking ghost. <laughs> Don't piss in my ass and tell me it's raining. I know you're a ghost. Don't try to... Uh, and B, berate. You're a fucking ghost. Stop it. You're spooking my friend Jack and you're making my friend Cody smell like shit. 
I isolate from friends and family. This one's important. You want to go ahead and lock the ghost out of its house. <laughs> Freeze its credit cards. Ghost cannot use cash. It falls right through their hand. <laughs> A. A is the most important part of the ghost hunting process. Assault. So, you get your gun out <laughs> and you point it right at the ghost, right? Fucking dead forever. Goodbye. All right. Now, folks, <laughs> bye-bye. Have fun in hell. As many of you can see, a ghost has just passed away for the second time. <laughs> folks, if you're anything like me, you've hunted a ghost for weeks only to shoot and kill it to find out, no, it was just a normal man. <laughs> This is by far worst case scenario. <laughs> Best case scenario, you just did a manslaughter. Worst case scenario, and in the, the facts are pointing at this, you just did a first degree murder, and you're looking at life. <laughs> and if you're in Texas, you're looking at the chair. So, <laughs> folks, good news. If you get on the stand for murdering a man whom you thought was a ghost, I got good advice for you. Take the stand in your own defense, and practice dunch. So dunch is pretty easy. <laughs> D, deflect. Maybe you were hunting a ghost. Maybe you killed the guy. I wouldn't even do that. I, <laughs> I'm actually really nice. And so maybe you thought that you could do that and you're blaming it on me. So nobody think that I did it. You, you is simple, unionize. Maybe some other people in this room have had this happen to them. <laughs> <laughs> now here's the bad part nobody's gonna own up to this so you're gonna dig a hole on this one which brings me to n n word now folks hear me out <laughs> hear me out this is <laughs> this is worst case scenario say the n word in the courtroom it's gonna make everybody super mad you they are going to <laughs> they are going to beat the fucking shit out of you all right now, surprise, you're the victim. Everyone's on your side, okay? Very good. Which brings me to C, have a glass of Chardonnay with the whole squad. And H, of course, just give everybody a big old hug, and then it's over. <laughs> now, guys, <laughs> as you can see, I've brought a sweet potato <laughs> stitch. I don't have time for that, but I would love to talk about it. Maybe next time I can talk about it. And, and I've drawn for you to see a, a very, uh, this is a picture accurate por portrait of a ghost that I saw last summer. It's this little fucking freaky little ghost and he's saying barf, like so gross, so that's that. And, <laughs> all right, so, all right folks, give me five more minutes, we can do this, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Did I write too much? Should I have ended it on a high note? Maybe. We're doing this because I wrote it out. I wrote it out. We're finishing strong. All right. You just beat the murder rap. Folks, now it's time to practice Ariba Dernchi. All right. Now, this one's really long. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this one's pretty fucking long, so... <laughs> All right, to make up for the police hassling you, A, arrest the police. Now you can see how it feels. Doesn't feel so good to be accused of murdering a man whom you thought it was a ghost, now does it? Reba, all right, so this one's pretty simple. Use your newfound fame to marry Reba McIntyre. She still looks good. She's still a babe, and that is very good to kiss. And she's your wife, which is good. And D, uh, D, dap them all up. What's up, man? I'm that guy who got acquitted of the ghost thing. Uh, <laughs> you, uh-oh, the ghosts are back. All right, the ghosts are back now. <laughs> and of course, E, eat cyanide. You are dead now. You can become a ghost, you can infiltrate their systems, and you can turn the whole system on its head. Fuzzy, I will see you in the green room, you piece of shit. We need to have a word, all right? <laughs> have a good night. <laughs> I'm Gert Billis. <laughs> Gert Billis, Gert. everybody. Gert Billis, the one and only. Wow. The beautiful. Absolutely. Amazing. <laughs> I think we all learned something here today. <laughs> You're going to report on the weather. It is Casey Rocket. Casey Rocket, everybody.
Okay. I don't know about you guys, but I'm here ready here. I don't know. Yeah, I'm ready here. It's a brother. Okay. Here they come. 76ers. Clap your hands for the 70. You enjoy learning about the news? Yeah. Well, guys, your next news correspondent's here to tell you all about the weather. Please give it up for Casey Rocket. Rocket, man. Give it up. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> no need. No need. Thank you. <laughs> Turn it off. Thanks. Uh, I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, I would have worn something nicer if I knew the Grimpsch was going to be here. Uh, <laughs> As many of you know, the Grimsch is a total bitch. Grimsch, Grimsch is this. Uh, folks, <laughs> Grimsch, as many of you know, Grimsch is this. Folks, let I guess that's <clears throat> all of that for now. What the fuck does Casey Rocket have to do with plant medicine? All right, guys. Well, this has obviously gone completely sideways, and it's been going on for five hours. And I probably haven't been paid much, so I'm going to bed. <laughs> Good night, y'all.